We see Chris rizzing up Royce's sister, telling him to make some undergarments out of the silk that he's giving her and hold up. What the hell are you trying to make her do, bro? Agatha is excited for her task, but interrupting the group, Amelia walks in. She tells Chris that she was offended that he stopped by her territory and didn't even say hello. Chris apologizes, but Amelia says it's okay, and even offers her family's help in taking the wolf's den. But Chris confidently tells her he doesn't need any help. Amelia is taken aback, but asks Chris how he's so confident to take this stronghold without royal support. Chris sips his drink and can tell that Amelia is smarter than she seems. In his past life, Chris knows that the Ziggall family survived even after the royal family's collapse, and this was due to Amelia's magic called intuition. So Amelia, you are the one-stringed wizard. There must be a symbol on your body. Chris ponders the reason why she is here, but Amelia asks if she can stay for a few days, and even requests to be called my lady. Chris says he'll call her that if she formally introduces herself as Lady Amelia, which shocks her. She takes back her previous statement and tells Chris that he can call her whatever she wants. Guys, Chris is teaching Rizonomics over here, like what the hell? Time passes and Grappe tells Chris that the wolf's den has responded to the declaration of war. Chris reads the response and thinks that it's quite aggressive. Grappe asks Chris if he's ready and they be getting a lot of pressure from the royal palace. Chris tells the man that they're almost ready, just a little bit longer. Grappe is shocked thinking to himself that Chris is really confident on taking this fortress. We shift to Desolio talking to an elder who asks if he really thinks Chris is up to the task. The elder isn't convinced and in all of his years, no one was able to take that fortress. This time will be no different. But even if Chris fails, the salt mines will be in their possession. But Desilio doesn't even know what outcome he even wants from Chris. We shift back to Proudman as Pumpkey is barking at Chris and Ego. The clouds are getting dark and this signals to Chris that it is time. As he calls all of his knights, they wear light armor and Chris tells the group not to pack many weapons. Take only what you need. Everyone suits up and Agatha wishes Chris well. Amelia watches the two lovebirds talking but looks at all the wise knights in front of her, shocked at Chris's influence. Chris puts on his hood, telling Amelia to watch closely. She feels the mark on her leg and thinks that Chris might actually take the fortress. It's time to go, but Grappe still doesn't understand how six of them will take the entire fort. This is too reckless. But Shriek tells the boy that he had his times doubting Chris. And he knows if there's one person who can find a way, it's him, Chris Proudman. He will be successful this day. We see the Wolf's Den stronghold getting some heavy rain. A commander is informed that the recon team hasn't found anything yet. Fedora, the commander, smirks with confidence. Just how long does Chris plan to hide? The soldiers tell their commander that this heavy rain is making it hard for their scout teams to continue. And maybe they should ask for assistance. But in this story, no smart soldier's advice is ever taken. As the commander tells him, it's not needed. This stronghold has only one path to it, a front road. And it's exposed, so any number of troops will instantly be spotted. The back of the castle faces a steep cliff. Fedora thinks that no matter how clever Chris is, he won't ever take this stronghold. The commander goes to take a nap, telling his soldier to update him, and we shift back to Chris and the boys. They are Naruto running through the forest, and Lin notices the rain getting stronger, and Chris thinks to himself that this is the only chance that they will have. We go back to Fedora, who's waken up by his soldier's screams, and the fort is overflowing. But as he wakes up, he notices his room is almost full of water. The heavy rain is filling the entire fort. The man orders his troops to get everyone to try and get rid of the water. And back to our heroes, the storm is getting worse for them as well. Their oiled cloaks are now wet. Chris tells everyone to remove the cloaks, and now they're going to run towards the fortress. As they approach, some soldiers see them coming, but assumes, since it's only six of them, that they can handle it. Chris doesn't want to let anyone escape and calls for Digo and Doki. They dash in, ending the two soldiers with ease. Chris tells everyone to stop and orders Doki to make a hole for everyone to climb in. And when Chris gives a signal, they will dive in. He overlooks the stronghold and reflects on his life. A lot of things have changed for him and those around him, but some things will never change. On this day in the year 899, even without Chris attacking, the wolf's stronghold was destroyed by the wrath of God, and the men inside are panicking. The water is overflowing and the commander locks himself in a tall room, despite his soldiers begging to go with him. Please open the door. He hears their screams as they drown and the man asks why this is happening here. He needs to get out. He enters the next room to see it full with more of his men. He tries to get them to move, but despite his orders, the next hallway fills with water, seemingly ending all of their hopes. Chris sees the tide approaching and orders his own men to get inside of the hole they made. They do so and begin holding their breaths, and Chris knows when the vibration stops, it'll all be over. The storm clouds soon clear, and somehow, Fedora has survived, as a hand extends to bring him up. But it's not one of his men, but rather, Chris, asking if the man doesn't recognize him, the mole hiding behind a wall. 
The fort was completely destroyed, as Chris now sends for his troops to occupy it. Grappe wonders if Chris received the revelation from God or something, but Chris just lies and says it was all luck. Grappe wants to ask more, but has work to do. Chris orders his archers to enter the fort and take positions, and the rest of his forces to begin repairs. Grappe watches on and thinks that Chris really might end up being a king. Nighttime comes, and Lind is joking around with Chris, but they see someone approaching. But it's Streak. He quickly enters the castle, telling Chris that they have an emergency. The king is dead. And at the same time, a rebellion began. The Grand Duke has raised his banner. Chris thinks on the situation, and he has been commanded to return to the palace. He bites his lip, and this is happening way too fast. What a disaster. Now, they won't be able to get extra troops from the capital. And on top of that, they need to withdraw their own troops from this territory. Right now, even after taking the stronghold. But Lin yells at Chris that another army is approaching. He is relieved to hear, however, that this is the Marquis Zighal's men. They are approaching, saying that they are here for their lady's orders. And Chris smiles. She's making it really hard for him not to like her. Chris orders Lin, Digo, and Royce to stay here with Zighal's men and defend the fort. The rest of them will return to join the war. We shift back to Proudman and Agatha is worried on what will happen. Chris says everything will be fine and asks Agatha if she made the clothes that he asked her to. Chris wears his cool new shirt and talks to Yaviron, telling her it's time to make a deal with the Eight Gates. She is shocked. How can they trade with them right after taking their stronghold? Chris says it will be fine and he puts on his armor. The wolves are a money-hungry faction and they sell salt to the gold family, so they can strike a favorable deal. Yvarin asks what to say if they don't accept and Chris tells her to remind those bastards what happened when he spared the green-eyed boy, referring to Perth. Yvarin thinks Chris is insane and asks, where he's, and asks where he's going, but he gets pumpkin and is off to make another ally. We now see Wee Hain sipping some wine thinking that both powers want his support and asks his knights what they think. Gideon thinks that they should wait and observe the situation before making a decision, but Jophil says the decision is quite easy. They just need to join the side with the most military power, and Weehane is in an opportunity to gain power. Now Sir Cardo rests on him, and it seems it's his time to become king. As the man smiles, Weehane Ludwig will rule the continent. Gideon wonders if this is the right path. Weehane is not a worthy leader, but Weehane asks if there's any information on Guyenne. It seems he sent word that he was training, but this just means he's avoiding his brother, which makes Weehane angry. He orders surveillance to be increased around the tower. If Gan appears, kill the woman. Chris is riding through the forest and tells Pumpkin to stop. Long time no see, Chris, and it's motherfucking Canary. Oh shit. They talk a bit, and we see Guyenne sitting by a tree. Chris walks up to see his longtime friend, and Guyenne is impressed. You actually took the stronghold, huh? And not too bad. But what's the deal? Chris asks Guyen what he plans to do during this war. He just sighs and it seems his moron brother wants to become king. Chris has been keeping tabs on the situation and knows why Guyen is still tied to Weehane, asking if he plans to keep his oath to his lady. Guyen turns around furious, sparking his aura, but Chris yells at him. How long are you going to be dragged around and leave that person trapped in that damn tower? Guyen tells Chris to watch his mouth and he draws his sword. If he talks anymore, he will have to kill him. Chris unleashes some of his own aura. He's not the same boy he was before, and the two face off. Guyen dashes in, but Chris blocks his strike, and the two send a flurry of attacks at each other that causes the earth around them to distort. Guyen is taken aback by how far Chris has gotten. What the hell are you? Kennery approaches, telling the two to calm down, and Pumpkin lets off a huge fire blast, separating the two. Even your dog breathes fire. What the hell? Fox comes asking if Guyen is alright, and Chris says hello. Guyen calms down and Chris asks if he really plans on doing nothing. Guyen doesn't want to get involved, but Chris asks him, how many people are in Daybed? Guyen answers that there is about 10,000, and Chris firmly tells the man that 10,000 lives will be lost if they don't stop Weehane. Kennery and Fox start to sweat, but Guyen doesn't seem interested in others, and tells Chris that Weehane is also targeting the South. Chris wonders why he would go there, but is informed that his target is Proudman. He's going to use this opportunity to make peace with the Eight Gates and have them back him for the throne. Chris thinks Weehane is a crazy bastard and even plans to sell out his own country. Chris can't waste any more time, and he's going to save that person that Guyen is sworn to and tells him to take care of Weehane. Guyen takes a moment and then asks Chris why he's going this far. The boy answers that it's all for this country. Guyen tells Fox to follow Chris and thinks that right now he doesn't even know what to do and has a flashback. We go to his younger days where he used to get into fights in the streets and how he would come home beaten and battered. But one woman would always be there for him. 
ready to treat him. But Guillen treated her like shit, pimp slapping her away. But even doing so would not turn the woman away, as she always would care for him. In his flashback, Guillen gets up from the bed and overhears the girl who is introduced as his mother talking to a man who's begging her to come with him, leaving Guillen behind. But she will never leave her son. Daisy is his mother's name, and not once does she ever betray Guillen. But one day, as he comes back to his home, he sees his mother being surrounded by a group of thugs. Guillen can't control his rage, and this is the first stage of his power awakened. He slaughtered all of the thugs holding his mother now, and Baron Ludwig enters the room, amazed at what he saw. Daisy wonders why the Baron came here, but he ignores her words, asking Guillen where he learned to fight. Guillen says that no one taught him, and the Baron asks if the boy wants to become a knight and be able to protect his mother. Three years pass and Guillen was finally promoted to a knight and his mother is so proud of him. He gets on one knee, swearing to the heavens that his sword will be hers and for the rest of his life he will protect her. Back to the present, Guillen looks on towards the tower that holds his mother. He can't get involved, but he trusts Chris will be able to save her. Please, let my mother be safe. Fox and Chris stand in the forest talking about Weehain mobilizing his forces, but it's time to move as they approach the tower. Fox fills Chris in on the layout of the tower, and the lady is confined on the top floor. And if anyone comes near, the maids have orders to kill Guillen's mother. Chris thinks that this is tricky. They can't walk into the front. But out of nowhere, Chris's ninja girlfriend appears, telling him that it's impossible. She can bring him a corpse, and that's the only thing she can guarantee. Fox gets angry at what she said, but Chris tells him to calm down. Rachel, let's talk about this for a moment. Rachel lowers her mask and says that Chris can use her, but she can't use him. Huh? Promise me that after this job is done, you will make an effort to find my name. Chris promises and asks if she has a plan. Rachel says that the two of them can infiltrate the tower on a bright night. Three days pass and the two are on top of a tree branch and they begin scaling the tower with their bare hands. One of the soldiers hears something, but Pumpkey comes up with a good idea and makes noise in the bushes. The man thinks that it's just a stupid dog and Rachel tells Chris that he's pretty good at climbing. But he did used to be in a thieves guild, so it's only natural. They continue to climb and Rachel asks if Chris is concerned about Proudman. The situation seems urgent. Chris knows that his back is to the wall, but fortunately for him, he has friends that he can trust. As you see Digo, Lind, and Royce bravely defending the stronghold as they hold down the defenses. The Eight Gates commander is getting impatient, asking about the troops that they sent towards the rear. We shift to this group as Bozo number one walks into a thin wire. Next, a smoke bomb explodes, and the men are being taken down one by one, as Chris's old herbalist friend steps out of the smoke, asking where these bastards plan on going. We shift back to Chris, and the two approach a window. Chris looks inside and sees Daisy, with a maid attending to her, and another one by the door. They can't enter like this. They need to draw away the maid that's next to Daisy. We shift to inside the room, and the lady asks to meet her son, but the maid tells her that she can't, and she just has to trust the Count. Daisy says that the Count that she knew is dead, and now Weehane is in control. So now she is forbidden to meet her son. Is that how it is? The maid has a wicked smile, telling the lady to please believe her. Guillen is just really busy. Daisy is tired, and she wants to die, and prays to see her son one final time. But all of a sudden, in the mirror, she notices Chris waving his hand. She knows what's going on, and asks to get some fresh air. The maid tells her that she can't leave, but Daisy yells for her to at least open the window. The maid walks towards it, warning the lady not to come close. They don't want to repeat what happened last time. But as she creaks open the window, Rachel comes flying in and Chris enters as well, kicking the shit out of the maid by the door, holding her down. They secure the lady and the soldiers catch on as they hear the commotion upstairs. Bozo 1 knocks on the door but is cut down, and now the soldiers begin flocking up the stairs. Chris takes care of them one by one, and if he can handle them like this, he should get out of here easily. A soldier goes to the commander, which is actually Mikoi, and the two are shocked to see each other again. Mikoi grits his teeth but knows that no one in this tower is strong enough to challenge Chris, and he orders his men back. His soldiers don't agree, but Mikoi starts yelling, telling them that he is a wise knight. They have no chance. The troops should fall back and wait for reinforcements. Chris tells Mikoi that it's been a while, and he's changed quite a bit. We shift to Weehain as Guillen stands in front of him, and Weehain yells, telling Guillen to drop his sword and take a vow to serve him. But all of a sudden, a soldier bursts into the room, telling Weehain that someone assaulted the tower. The man is now stressed as he curses his brother, and he orders his men to capture Guillen. But he ain't no bitch as he gets into his stance and draws his sword, dismembering everyone around him. 
He will keep this short. Anyone who stands in his way will die. We shift back to Chris escorting Guillen's mother down the tower. He looks out the window and sees Guillen arrive. The soldiers outside the tower are confused. We Hain and Guillen are here. Guillen opens the doors to the towers and sees his mother. Emotion overflows as the two hug each other. Guillen promises to never let something like this ever happen again. Chris looks at his friend and tells him that it's time to go. Guillen can't find the words to say, but Chris yells at him, asking how long he plans to stand idle. Is seeing your mother enough? Will you let Van Ludwig's legacy die in vain? Accept your fate and continue forward. Guillen Ludwig. The man now has a new look of determination, asking Chris what they should do about Weehain. Chris says that they can't kill him just yet, but the two need to leave. Guillen tells his mother that he will be back. She cries, asking him to please return safely. Chris tells Daisy not to worry. Her son has grew up into a fine man. Guillen opens the doors to see Weehain surrounding the tower. And the cocky brat orders his crossbowman to fire at Guillen. Guillen just walks with no pressure and swats down every arrow. Weehain orders his knight to catch the traitor, but Guillen yells asking Weehain, who is he calling a traitor? As he opens up a decree showing the knights that Weehain has been dealing with the eight gates and planned to betray their kingdom. Weehain calls himself a king, and I, Guillen, proclaim, I will not let the land my father spent his life protecting to be sold. To the enemy and hereby banishes Weehain from this land. Weehain tries to order his troops to defend him, but the uncertainty starts to creep in as Gideon himself starts to doubt his leader. Half of their troops are with Jodfil, and now some of Weehain's soldiers are beginning to turn on him, asking if what Guillen is saying is true. Long have they suffered because of his selfish ass. Gideon kills the soldier and tells Weehain they need to leave now and orders his men to retreat. We now shift to the first front, the Salio's military headquarters. The man asks if Chris is here yet, but is informed of Ludwig's aggression on Proudman. The older man thinks that the situation suits them. Chris is busy taking care of someone who betrayed the crown. The Salio is concerned on that situation, but the older man watches him, thinking that every event that is happening is pre-planned. The first prince is strong, but lacks intelligence. The second prince is too weak, and the third prince has a strong body, but lacks character. And a country without a king is destined for destruction. The only relief is that the first prince listens to those who can persuade him. So the elder tells the prince to calm down. The duke started a war without justification, and this is treason. They are not alone in defending the royal family, and soon their allies will arrive and this war will turn out as a total victory. We shift back to Ludwig's territory and Chris and Guillen are roaming the streets. Weehain ran with his tail between his legs and some nobles begin to shit talk Guillen. They agreed to follow his father, not him, and unrest begins to build. But Guillen won't force anyone to stay. Chris asks if this is a good idea, but Guillen says he can't hold anyone back and asks Chris what he plans to do. Chris has his own problems and needs to amass his forces, but in the meantime, wants to have a duel. Guillen just laughs, thinking how Chris can ask for a duel in a situation like this. But Chris's real goal is to level up his wise proficiency, and right now, he's at 38. And every 10 levels, it's a huge boost to his strength. Guillen is a 4th level wiser, so Chris needs to catch up in order to fight the Duke. We shift to Weehain, completely destroyed over what's going on. One moment he was a lord, and now he's running for his life. Weehain has the bright idea to join Jodfil and Proudman, but Gideon sees something coming out of the bushes, and tells his lord to step back. But arising is Jodfil and his troops, all beaten and battered. He was unable to do much against Proudman's defense, but he took minimal casualties and decided to retreat hoping to regroup, but it seems Weehain's hopes are starting to disappear. A few days pass and Chris is meeting with all of his knights and overlooks his troops. He has his personal squad along with 200 soldiers, but we see Guillen and Kenry on horseback. Guillen dismounts and takes a deep breath and yells to the whole crowd that he is Guillen Ludwig. And after the death of his father and banishment of his brother, who lied with the enemy, he will now inherit the throne of the Count. And from this moment forward, he will serve only one man. Gien gets on one knee and swears his allegiance to Baron Chris Proudman. And even if his body becomes old and rusty, he will fight on any battlefield for his lord. Chris is taken aback by this display, but accepts Gien's oath, and he will guide his sword. He tells his men to rise and points his spear to the sky, ordering everyone to prepare. They're riding into battle. We are taken to the battlefield in question as a soldier is running for his life but is splatted like a bug by Valmung. He's getting bored of these weaklings and he orders his men to clean this up. Rold watches from a nearby cliff and his knight is getting excited. Ryzen 
Ryzen informs him that the general of Tigis has come to support the royal family, and this news makes Rold smile. It doesn't matter who stands in his way, he will destroy them all. Rold asks about that brat, Chris, and is informed that he's fighting Ludwig's troops. He doesn't think he's going to be able to get out of Proudman, but Rold has a confident look. He is almost certain that Chris will arrive to face him. We shift to the Elder, who is introduced as the Earl of Hydo, and he is told that the Duke's men are advancing north, and this is faster than they anticipated. The Cilio still questions where his reinforcements are, but right on cue, Tegas' troops arrive. The Cilio walks out and has a pleasant surprise. He never would have thought that this man would come himself, as we're introduced to another badass, the General of Tegas. Lance King, Abel. The Earl is shocked at his arrival, and his presence is heavy, and this man is known as the strongest in the Central Continent, despite his age of 70 years. His strength was invaluable, even to the King. But Abel interrupts asking if Chris will be here. He kinda wants to spar him, at least once, and man, everybody wants a piece of our boy. We shift back to Chris, and Lind asks if he has a plan. He knows that the Duke's army is steamrolling the Salio's men, and their first stop should be Rold's estate. Chris and his men are on the move and he tells Guillen to hold his position and scan the surroundings. They are approaching a castle as the men notice the hundreds of horses coming around. The man on top of the wall sees the Proudman insignia and is shocked. Aren't they supposed to be fighting Ludwig? Did he already defeat that large army? When interrupting his thoughts, Lin lets off an arrow from a couple hundred meters away, but the captain manages to catch it a centimeter before his neck. Lind is disappointed, but the captain breaks the arrow and sees a note tied to it. Stick together. The captain has to calm himself. He needs to defend this castle for his lord. Chris is a man that was recognized by the duke. He can't take him lightly. He orders his troops to ignore them for now. Lin sees what's going on and Chris knows that this is to be expected of the knight who doesn't bleed. With man, fade us. Something like this won't shake him. It's time for plan B. He orders his men to set up camp and Withron begins reading a book as one of his soldiers comments on how bold Chris is. They just need to be patient and wait for their lord's return. Three days pass and he sees Chris just partying with his men, drinking to their heart's content. Withran wonders if Chris really is a baron, but all of a sudden some troops are approaching from the west gate as we see Weehane's remnants arriving. And this confuses Withran. Weren't these the two armies that were just fighting? Chris is alerted to Weehane's arrival and this is just as he planned. It's time to begin. Right now Withran feels surrounded and needs to prepare an escape route and thinks that he'll have his cavalry break through the east side and destroy the enemy. Digo is sent alone to meet this force. Chris can't lose any more troops, but it's time to show them the strength of Proudman. As Digo unleashes his transcendental fear, he lets off a huge slash, taking out dozens of horsemen. Withran is in all. Chris sent one man to deal with his cavalry. How far will he insult Withran's strength? The man starts to become furious and is falling right into Chris's trap. Digo continues his assault, killing one after the other with ease. Withran can't believe that Digo just walked into the center of his cavalry without a second thought. How reckless. Even if he is strong, Digo is just a simpleton, and Withran still believes that he can escape. He orders his archers to fire, and Digo's horse is shot down. Chris's troops are unable to assist, and Royce wants to go in and help, but Chris holds him back. He knows Withran's personality. If he can't win, he will run, and Chris is familiar with his thought process and his experience in war, but believes in Digo but believes that Digo will break their foolish delusions. We shift back to when Chris was training his knights and they need to unlock the wise skill double. Their enemies are on the fourth stage, overhuman, and they're already behind. Digo is sparring Royce, but Digo is starting to overpower him. Chris knows that this man's strength is not affected by double yet, and he's just naturally this strong, and he's slowly becoming a monster. Withran orders his men to surround Digo, and they begin to encircle him. But his wide slashes prevent them from coming close. But a spear is hurled, charged with wide energy. It doesn't connect, but grazes Digo's side. And Withran is among his troops. The assault, the assault combines the troops and Withran's spear throws, and is starting to take its toll on Digo. He's losing ground. He knows he has only one chance. After taking hit after hit, Withran thinks that he has him now. He has to make sure. His spears start to do more damage, and Digo kneels to the floor, coughing up blood. Withran comes confidently and hurls another spear, and it pierces Digo's side, causing Royce to yell out. Chris is worried, and Withran holds his spear, telling Digo to be proud. He is quite the fighter, but Digo isn't done yet. He uses his strength to hold the spear into his body. I got you now. 
With Ran starts to panic, and Digo breaks the spear and charges his wise energy. We shift back to Taikil saying that if Digo can reach double, his strength will be comparable to overhuman, as Digo unleashes his aura and dashes in. With Ran's soldiers try to block him, but they are removed with a single strike. With Ran looks over at Digo as the light of his halberd reflects off of his helmet, and all he can do is apologize to his lord. And Digo doesn't just remove his head, but half of his body, and the boy begins to yell at the top of his lungs. Digo has reached a new level. This display crushes the morale of With Ran's troops. Even if they are outnumbered, Chris has the upper hand. He moves forward, yelling to the Duke's forces that their commander is dead. If they hand over the castle, he will let them live. The next in line was informed by Withran already that if he died, to save his strength and join the main army. He orders his men to abandon the fort. Lind wonders if it's okay, but Chris is also worried about preserving his own fighting force. And a siege would definitely not end without casualties. In a civil war, the more bloody it is, the weaker the nation becomes. They need to end this soon, for Sir Cardo's sake. They have only one goal now to eliminate the Duke's forces. And just as expected, Weehane hasn't negotiated with the Duke. Chris puts on a helmet and calls for Guillen and Royce. Weehane is at the west gate getting impatient and turns to leave. But a man comes out of the gate ready to meet them and relay the information. We see Weehane's tent as his soldiers let these people in. But now another soldier comes in informing Weehane that something's off. The Duke's men are escaping the castle, and the men they're meeting right now are completely different. Weehane is in despair as a familiar voice is heard. It's been a while, huh? The guards try to protect their lord, but they are easily handled. Weehane grabs the sword, asking who this man is, but Chris just laughs. You're busy following me around, yet you don't know who I am, huh? He removes his helmet, and Weehane is seething with anger, and calls to Jodfil, but his boy's a little busy with a sword in his stomach. Gien tells Gideon to step back, and now the rat is cornered. Weehane puts the dots together, and Chris is responsible for everything, freeing Gien's mother and driving him into the situation. He tries to rush in with his sword, but Chris easily just pimp slaps it out of his hand, sending him to the ground. Chris will end this pathetic man's life. But Weehan yells out for his own brother to save him. Please, they're related, right? Chris is disgusted by this act and removes Weehan's head. The rest of Weehan's troops don't even know what's going on, but Gideon walks out of the tent with a sword to his neck. The troops are now shocked. What's going on? But they now see Gideon and Chris exit the tent, with Chris holding Weehan's head. He raises it to the sky and tells everyone that Weehan is dead and throws it to the feet of these traitors. And it only took 90 chapters, but finally this motherfucker is out of the story. Chris reminds the nobles who fled with Weehane that he's eliminating evil from his country. And never in his life did he expect to see Count Ludwig's men like this. Is this really the army that once defended these borders? Are you not the guardians of the castle wall, the fence of Cercado? Are you not the men who defended it down to your last breath? Are you the same soldiers who fought alongside me against the eight gates? One of the nobles tries to speak. Why is Chris talking and not Guillen? But Guillen says that he serves Chris now. Chris continues his speech. Don't fight for me, but fight for yourself. Don't run anymore. Become the sword that ends this civil war. You are the wall that protects this country, the Ludwig army. Gideon drops to the floor with tears streaming down his face. He cries to be reinstated as a guardian of the castle wall. Please give me one more chance. Chris turns to the rest of the Ludwig army and tells them that it is time to end this chaos and to end this war. There's no more time to talk. They are hunting the Flying Tiger's Beard, which is a nickname for Duke Rold. We shift back to the royal family army, and the fight is not looking good for them as Duke Rold's men begin pushing forward. The Earl is thinking to himself about what the General Tegus is planning. His movements are too passive. The Cilio is placed in a hard spot, and we now see Chris sparring with Kian. His wise proficiency isn't improving, and it's still stuck at 39. Is 40 that big of a leap? Chris calls for Ellis next, but Lind interrupts, informing him that the scouts are back with a report. Chris orders Guillen to supervise the training and he tells his knights to hone their skills as much as possible before their final battle. Chris looks over at a battle map and sees the royal army has retreated and General Tegas has joined, but it seems they still can't deal with the Duke's army. Lin thinks that now would be a great time to attack Roll's rear, but Chris's real objective is to attack the Salio, but he can't just yet. Their first objective should be to end the civil war. They need to stick to the plan. Duke Rold is overlooking his army and is informed that Withran is dead. Rold wonders if they 
Rold wonders if it was a mistake to leave him behind, but now their problem is Chris, who could be attacking their rear at any moment, and they run the chance of being surrounded. The Duke isn't scared, however, since the Royal Army won't move. They have no communication with Proudman. Ryzen asks how he can know this, but Rold tells him that he knows the Salil like the back of his hand. The Earl of Hydo won't let him move so easily. Rold unsheathes his sword and pumps it full of aura, excited for his encounter with Chris. The two armies are now facing each other as Valm begins to charge. Lind orders his troops to stand by and his flanks to spread out. They're going to surround them. Valmung enters the battle first but is met by Digo. It's been a while, huh? Nice to meet you again. Ellis interrupts the reunion and causes Valmung to dismount. He lands and warns the young knights that today they won't be spared. Lind is still coordinating the troops and Rold's commander is trying to counter their movements but is hit with the real plan. Chris is aiming directly for the duke and at this rate he's going to reach him. He tries to order his troops but Guillen appears from behind unleashing his blade. Did we meet before? Well, not like it matters now. Can you please step aside? I have a duke's throat to split. Guillen's aura begins to rise but Ryzen begins to get angry. In the center of the duke's army a smoke bomb goes off. The troops rush to defend their lord, but Doki just comes in flying with two axes like a goddamn savage. He hits the ground, causing hundreds of men to be displaced. He begins his assault, ripping them to shreds, but behind him stands a towering presence, as the duke himself tells his barbarian to get out of his way. He slams his weapon down, aggravated that Chris is so cocky to meet him like this. But we see Chris intercept his strike, saving Doki. The duke begins to smile. He is happy to see Chris again, and Chris is too. It's been a while, your highness. Chris tells Doki to join the main force and hold his back, but he has his hands full as the duke slowly approaches. This encounter reminds him of the first time he met Chris, and now he understands the boy's determination and tells him that he is his rival. The duke lets off a heavy blow, but Chris blocks. Chris says that he hates obsessed old men, and the two disengage. Chris lets off a barrage of spear stabs. Rold parries them with ease and rushes in. Chris is sent back with one blow, and the Duke warns the boy not to disappoint him. And as expected, he has overhuman. The Duke is way stronger than Kien, and his weapon has a wide range. Chris needs to level up as he fights, and can't hold back. He unleashes his maximum aura and dashes in behind the duke. He prepares his aura into his dagger and stabs at the duke's weapon, cutting it in half. But Rold isn't impressed and unsheathes his real weapon. Chris notices the frost on his armor. An artifact? The duke has an artifact? Snow White, an ice element sword. We shift to Desilio and he wants to help Chris, but the Earl tells him to think about it. Is Chris even on their side? Chris was easy to ally with the Southerners and Ludwig. When this war is over, he will be a thorn that will haunt them. Desilio isn't decisive and agrees, and the Earl doesn't care who wins. Both are his enemies. We see Digo still in the heat of the battle, trading blows with Falmung. Fighting him on horseback is annoying, so Falmung chops the horse's head off. But Ellis comes in from behind, which makes Valmung turn to defend. Digo comes in again, but is elbowed back a few meters. Ellis tries to help, but she manages to barely dive under a huge sword slash. Digo tries to get up, but Valmung is stronger than he thought. It's hard for him to move. Valmung looks over at Digo, and from what he remembers, Digo wasn't this weak. Are you injured? Well, doesn't matter. You're gonna die anyways. Right before Digo is hit, Royce comes flying in, and Valmung gets annoyed and begins chasing after the two. But an arrow stops his assault, as we see Lind firing charged shots at him. Ellis is also in the fight, using her water aura to strike as well, cutting his cheeks. It seems Valmung has his hands full, and his anger begins to build. Heads are being chopped off everywhere, as Kennery himself is on the battlefield, killing motherfuckers left and right. Doki joins him, and he was sent by Chris. Kennery yells, asking who is gonna defend Chris if Doki is here. Have you lost your mind? But Doki isn't much of a talker, and it was Chris's order. Kennery orders his men to break through. They are joining the Baron. Gien and Ryzen continue their fight, and Ryzen is impressed. But if Gien listened to his master, he would have conquered the continent, and today, Chris will die. Gien just smirks, and the two disengage. You don't know anything about Chris, so stop talking. He's the man that I've chosen. Gien charges up and dashes back in, sending a quick upward slash that separates Ryzen's chin. But it wasn't enough to kill him. And now we see Chris and the Duke sizing each other up. Chris analyzes the Duke's sword, and it cannot be easily broken. But he will need to block his strikes with his own spear. The Duke asks if Chris is scared, but our boy never backs down as he rushes into the fight. The Duke's attacks now send frost strikes with it, and Chris notices the difference in their strength. He can't win with force, but interrupting his thoughts, Rold appears to his side and slashes at him, sending the boy back. Chris coughs up blood, and his left arm is starting to be paralyzed from the frostbite. The situation is dire. 
and Chris can't think of a way through. But for some reason, Chris is enjoying every moment of this fight as he smiles, asking the Duke if he feels the same way. The two men clash swords and it seems finally Chris understands what Rold has been feeling. Chris is an opponent he will never face again. The two send strikes that cause shockwaves and Kennery and his men are rushing, worried about Chris. Not that he doesn't have faith in him, but he knows the monster that is the Duke. But as Kennery approaches, he sees the Tiger King's troop watching the battle, shouting the Duke's name, making Kennery think that Chris is dead. But when he arrived, the soldiers began to forget about the battle for a second and get mesmerized by something. They start shouting and in the center of it all was Chris and Rold. Kennery looks on and this is no longer the boy that he once knew. He is now a monarch whose time has come. Kennery was overwhelmed by emotion and screams at the top of his lungs, Chris, hang in there. Kennery was letting out years of resentment hidden inside of him. Chris, the king of the castle wall. The crowd of thousands of men goes silent, and even Rold is taken aback. But Chris's men begin to join Kennery, yelling for Chris the hero, the king of the castle wall. Rold now knows Chris's true goal, to become king. You bastard. Chris tells the Duke that if all the people who believed in him and fought with him don't call him a king, then who deserves to become their king? That's a sick line right there. This is the coolest part of the manhwa, I swear. I hope you guys are enjoying it. Rold is impressed that Chris is finally showing his true colors, and Chris smirks, asking if the man is anxious. But Rold is happy and is delighted seeing his fighting spirit. Chris feels his left arm starting to give up, and there's no time left to hesitate as he rushes back in on Rold. Rold switches the hand he's using to grip his sword and meets the strike, sending Chris back. The two's auras flare up as the battle gets intense. But what's this? Rold is being pushed back. How can this bastard, who's at his limit, be holding me back? And he keeps getting stronger, as you see Chris's spear technique level up to 79. Roll tries to get an overhead slash, and Chris manages to block it, but knows he's being pushed back, as Kennery and Doki yell for their comrade. Roll stands over him, and unfortunately, his left arm won't be usable anymore. It's all over. Chris kneels on the ground, but asks, over? How was this over? Who decided that? Rold is even more impressed as he comes to find that Chris is ambidextrous. He wished that he wasn't this brave and the two rush back in at each other. Chris sends a barrage of spear strikes that takes back Rold and he knows it will be difficult to defeat this man but still he'll never give up. The two send strikes back and forth and disengage. Chris runs back in knowing he can't give up. He has to protect everyone that has risked their lives and changed everything in time to be by his side. Chris rushes in and it seems he's pushing Rold back as the man dashes back dodging a wide slash. Chris knows that he has a bright future ahead and he charges the aura into his foot and into the tip of his spear and he's gonna make everyone's dreams become a reality. His wise proficiency levels up to 40 and he will put his life on the line to defeat this man. Rold starts to get impressed and charges up his own energy and vows to end this. The two with their aura surging rush in at each other but in a single strike they dash past each other. Chris's spear is still lighting up with aura and the soldiers watch on in awe. But Rold is missing his side. He gets down on one knee, feeling the effect of this wound. His soldiers call out to their majesty, but Rold tells them to step back as blood oozes from his mouth. He stands up with this giant gash in his side. What a savage. And he walks up to Chris. Do you really think you'll become king? Chris just says that he doesn't know, but he's going to try. Rold tells him not to put off that decision. Kill Prince Desilio. But please don't kill Sir Cardo. Chris knows why the Duke was worried and says that he will. With his last breaths, Duke tells everyone to listen up. I, Lotharium, Rold, Gauche, order you. From this moment forward, all the knights and military commanders under his command will now be led by Rido Spen. If Rido Spen dies, then Chris Proudman will take over his legacy. And with this statement, Rold falls to the ground. His eyes begin to fade. He can't believe that it's over. But still, it was fun. Chris tells him to rest well, Tiger Duke. Now footsteps are heard as the royal army begins to charge. Finally, the civil war is over, but Chris looks over and sees something is weird. The mounted troops are not slowing down. He overhears what they're saying, and they're saying it's time to wrap up this war. The disgusting rebels of the kingdom and the traitors who are shamelessly enough to communicate with the eight gates kill them all as Desilio leads the charge, attacking his own men. Chris understands the betrayal that is now happening, but you know, he wanted to kill Desilio too, so it's only fair. The men are back in the heat of the battle, and Chris yells at the top of his lung, cursing the first prince. The men are being taken down one by one, and even Desilio is in the battle. He tells them not to miss a single person, pick out all the roots of revolution. Chris yells asking how much blood did they have to shed to end this war. But the after effects of the battle are beginning to take its toll on Chris as he gets a shock and he falls to his knees. Kennery yells towards Chris asking if he's alright. 
He yells towards the men taking care of the Duke's body and tells them to get out of this place. The men yell that they're soldiers of the Tiger Duke. Retreating is not in their vocabulary and they'll fight till they end up dead. Chris yells telling them that no good will come out of their death. Don't let the demise of their duke go to waste. And tells his own men to pay attention. The special force will retreat and they will join with the main force. But interrupting his thoughts is a purple aura enveloping a spear that crashes down sending a huge explosion. It's the Lance King Avil as he yells for Chris Proudman. Finally, he gets to meet him. Is that the Tegas' armor? Then this is the old commander? The Lance King? Why is he here? Lance King Avil tells Chris to bring it on. He came all this way to fight him and dashes in at Chris. The man tries to send the strike but Doki ends up blocking. Ah, two-handed axe technique. Are you a southerner? This world really is full of interesting bastards, as he sends Doki back with a single slash. Chris realizes the strength that he had in that one strike. He must be a fourth stage wiser or higher. Abel asks what the hell is going on with Chris. Why is he so beaten and bruised? This must be the cause of his battle against the Tiger Duke. Oh, so you're exhausted, huh? I won't get anything if I fight you like this. I'll give you one day. Come back to a state where you can fight me on equal footing. Mind this, this isn't a simple request, but we won't just be sparring. It will be better for you not to run away. If you do that, I will turn my forces on Sir Cardo and your county of Proudman. Abel just gets disappointed and asks Chris to leave. It's embarrassing that so many people are watching. Chris turns and thanks Abel, but Doki says he's ready to kill this bastard. Chris calms him down, saying that they can't do anything yet. Kennery doesn't know what this guy is planning, and neither does Chris, as he thinks to himself that if he was really aiming for his life, he would have ended it right then and there. But maybe Abel's goal is different from the royal family. Chris sees enemy soldiers rushing in, but the first guy is sniped by Lind. Chris tries to regroup as more enemies start to descend on him, but Gien comes slashing them down in front of him. He calls out to Chris and tells his troops to protect their lord. Chris asks Lind what the current situation is, and is told that both of the Duke's swords have been destroyed. They succeeded in crushing the Duke's army in one day. Chris asks about his knights, but is told not to worry. Everyone is saved, though they are quite injured. Chris mounts on Lin's horse, and he tells Lin that the royal army has joined Tegas' forces, and they'll soon come after them. Doki and Gien are ordered to clear the way. They're leaving this place. The first prince's troops try to stop them, but they can't. They're being overpowered. Some time passes, and the Earl is screaming at Abel. How did he let this happen? They could have had Proudman. They could have had the Baron. Abel just laughs, saying that he was faster than he expected. And the Earl turns towards the first prince. They should chase them immediately. Abel says that they can't do that. His soldiers need time to recover. And says that they'll advance tomorrow instead. The Earl is getting annoyed how he can say that after he barely fought for even a second. But Abel, just like a savage, says that it looks like they don't need his support anymore. And threatens to leave. The Salio tells the two to calm down. And asks the Lance King if he's sure he can end the Baron's life tomorrow. And is told that he can. The Salio says that it's decided. And they will march in 24 hours. The Earl is getting annoyed and wonders what this bastard is up to, and he can't trust him any longer. He's going to kill Chris with his own hands. We now see Chris's forces link back up in their camp as Chris rejoins his squadron. He sees Digo inside, but he's completely battered. Chris asks if everyone is okay. Digo got the worst of it, but he's injured resting inside of the tent. Chris looks at the situation, and it's far worse than he anticipated. Everyone is exhausted, and at this rate, Chris wonders if they can even win tomorrow. He tells his men that the arrows of war are rushing towards us, and this war won't end until the royal family obliterates us. The allied army is now joined by Tegas' forces, and they're going to catch up tomorrow. But before he can finish, Ellis just smiles. Don't worry, Captain. I'll smash him tomorrow. None of his men are even feeling an ounce of doubt, as even Guillen says that no one can match up to Chris. Don't tell me you're afraid now. Chris has a soft smirk, and it seems that he was the one that lacked motivation the most. But thanks to all of his friends, his mind is clear. He will always be in their care. And this time tomorrow, they're going to fight like their lives depend on it. Nighttime comes, and Chris is all bandaged up, and he lays back in his tent thinking about the Lance King. He's a stubborn motherfucker and only lives to fight against any rival. That's the only thing he's heard about him from his old master. The Salio pulled his hidden card to deal with Chris, but it turned out to be a complete waste of time. All Abba wants to do is have a battle with Chris. And Chris is sure he's not even interested in operating with the Royal Army. He needs to make full use of this loophole as Chris begins charging and harnessing his aura. The next day comes and Chris mounts, seemingly rejuvenated, and Lind by his side. Their forces are behind them and the Salio approaches. Both men yell for their troops to charge in and the battle continues. All of Chris's knights are in the thick of things, cutting soldiers down left and right. Abel and Chris walk immediately to each other and Abel asks how his body is doing. You're not going to die after one hit, 
are you? Chris thinks to himself that he's only recovered around 40%. He will make sure that Abel doesn't regret the decision he made the other day. Abel gets excited and tells the kid to bring it on, and the two lunge in at each other. Abel sends heavy swings of his lance that Chris barely manages to dodge. Chris sends his own spear, but Abel, even at 70 years, is able to do an acrobatic move backward to dodge it, commenting on how quick the boy is. Chris picks up some daggers from his back pocket and throws them at Abel. Abel comments on the technique, but easily blocks him. Chris rushes in, spear in hand, but Abel continues to easily parry his attacks. He kicks Chris's back and has his own strike and sends a wide slash that Chris ducks under. Abel stops for a second, thinking that Chris is quite remarkable, but he's lacking in some areas. Chris is excited, and he's indeed the Lance King that he heard about. He fights on a whole different level. We shift back to Desilio, and the Earl tells him he's also going to participate in this attack. Desilio is shocked. Are you really about to step forward? The Earl tells him not to worry. He knows the best method in order to end this civil war, and this Leo allows him. The Earl ends up riding thinking that Abel was a fool for missing Chris, and he's sure now that the only reason he's even on their side is for his personal entertainment. But the Earl doesn't want any more distractions, and he's going to end everything with his own hands, and he will take over Sir Cardo as he has a wicked smile. Chris's fight with the Lance King is continuing as he throws more knives, but these kind of tricks won't work on him. But along the knives is a thin thread. The Lance King tells him to do something to entertain him as he takes his lance and he hurls it back, slamming it into the ground, creating a huge crater. Chris dodges and turns back, and but the Lance King is right on his tail. His spear proficiency levels up to 80, alerting him to this rise. He leveled up with a spear still in his hands. If this is the case, then something might be possible. As he dashes away, Abel chases him, telling him that he can't run. This is futile, but... Chris finally has him in his trap as he yanks all the strings that had all the knives from the floor. He calls this move, in the visible wire, Spider Hell, as all of the knives that Chris thrown were strategically placed in different areas. The wires are pulled and the Lance King is tripped, surprising him to what happened. Chris takes advantage of the opportunity, jumping above the Lance King ready to end him. But this man isn't no pushover, as he uses his own lance to strike the ground, causing an explosion propelling him another way. Chris is taken aback to how he manipulated his wise, and the Lance King just stands there laughing. How many steps did you plan ahead? That was truly a masterpiece, Chris. Chris thinks to himself that he still can't win against this guy, not with his current skill. His own skin is solid like armor, and this might be a wall that's impossible to cross. Abel is a fifth stage wiser, with a nickname, The Wall. Chris notices something interrupting the fight, however, as a huge fire spell is thrown at Chris. He dodges back and the Earl tells him that they're both dumbass knights, and he will make them kneel before the power of magic as he stands preparing another spell. A wizard? Chris notices that this is the Earl of Hydo, the wizard who appeared during the Civil War in his past, and now he has two enemies. This might be bad. Abel stands there and is annoyed. How dare you intervene in my fight? As the Lance King's aura flares up into the sky, he's gonna rip this man apart limb from limb. Chris can't believe that Abel is this angry. And one of the soldiers even comes in commenting that don't they have an agreement? They can't just attack each other. But Abel asks why he can't. And now, this sentence alerts Chris. An agreement, huh? So Abel can't harm the royal family right now. So it's time to utilize this piece of information. Chris asks if the Lance King can leave this to him. He's not going to step in their way if he steps forward and kills him. So please, let me do this. The Lance King smiles and it seems that Chris is onto something. He says he's lost his excitement and now he will take his leave. Chris says he'll learn a few more cool tricks to use in the future. And the Lance King hopes that he keeps his promise and orders his troops to withdraw at once. The Earl is shocked at what's going on. How can you do this? But he fires another spell, but Chris is at his side. The Earl prepares his hand and motions another blast towards Chris. Chris thinks that this is annoying. This wizard is making it hard for him to get close. He keeps running around, dodging these spells one by one. But Lind comes and throws Rold's artifact towards Chris. Chris thanks Lind for the good work and tells him that it's time to go. And tells him that they'll attack at the same time. Lind lets off a volley of arrows, but the Earl is still confident, thinking his magic will overtake them. He is Hido, the only sorcerer in Zircardo. Chris rushes in at the spell, but slices it away with the artifact. The Earl is taken aback, and it looks like all he can do is play with fire, as Chris ends his life with a single slash. Desilio, after seeing this display, is in despair that his only comrade was killed. Lin points over towards the First Prince and tells the troops where he is. Doki is now chasing after him as Desilio tries to regain himself. Doki jumps in the air with two axes ready to kill this man. 
that Salio tries to intercept, but Do cuts his arm off in a single slash, causing him to scream in agony. One of his soldiers comes up and orders his men to protect their majesty. He makes a makeshift bandage, telling Desilio that he needs to retreat. Someone needs to survive. They can rally the troops and fight again. At least he should make it out of this. He gets the first prince on the horse and tells him that he'll buy him some time. But as he's trying to let him escape, Doki's axe politely sits him down. Desilio is shocked after seeing this and begins running away, yelling for someone to save him. And I mean, he was looking badass for like half a chapter, but you know, yeah, it is what it is. Gien orders his troops to chase after him. The enemy is escaping, as Desilio thinks on how things turned out like this. He was supposed to win this war. What on earth went wrong? Lin asks Chris if they should chase him, but Chris tells him there's no need. This war is already over. The only thing left is Desilio's decision. We see Desilio return to his nobles, and they're concerned of what happened to his arm. Desilio says the rebel army is going to attack soon. They need to start acting before they put them into a siege. He tells them to gather all the royal ministers and prepare a countermeasure. We now see them inside of the palace, and the nobles try to come up with a solution. They need to fight to the very end. Desilio has his hand on his head. He has no idea what he should do. Maybe they should run and take refuge with Tigus. Desilio doesn't like this idea. What will people think of him then? This country needs a king, but Desilio is back into a corner. A man says that the preparations for Tigus have finished, and Desilio tells the man to prepare a carriage. He now sits at the table alone and sighs, but hears footsteps behind him. Rachel comes, asking if the man was planning on leaving. Desilio gets up, asking, who are you? How did you get in here? Rachel says her orders were to kill everyone who tried to leave and spare those who stayed. Desilio tries to argue with Rachel. Please don't come any closer. What's wrong with you? What did I do wrong? But in his screams, Rachel dashes him, slashing his throat in a single strike. And with that, the civil war was over. And apart from the news regarding the deaths of the Tiger Duke and Desilio, another report was sent of the demise of the second prince in an unexpected event. The only surviving members of the royal family were the two queens and the third prince, Eric. So the only direct bloodline, Eric Sercardo, sat on the throne. Chris is called up to the throne and he's the hero who brought the end to the civil war. He will be granted fiefs including the estates of Savonad and Vengtes, and he will be appointed as Duke. We shift to Chris back in Proudman and all of his boys congratulate him on the promotion. But Chris tells him to get ready. From now on, things will get busy. And now that they're controlling more territory, there's going to be more for them to worry about. And besides, they don't know when war might start up again, so they need to increase the number and strength of their army as soon as they can. He recruited some more soldiers, and he said that he did. He sent some circulating announcements throughout Sercardo, and the ones who have been recruited are currently on standby. Chris has a sigh of relief, but before he can get to the next topic... Tykeel is at the door, telling him that there's something he needs to tell him. Tykeel's veins begin to bulge, and there's a scar on his beautiful daughter's face. How should a father feel about that? Chris starts to get scared and says that that scar has nothing to do with him, but Tykeel just drags Chris out of the room, saying that he has a special training regiment for him. All the boys start laughing and wish their duke good luck. After Chris was beaten to a pulp, he goes with Grappe to see all of the new recruits. Grappe tells Chris the plan is to reinvest all the revenue from the sales of the salt for war preparation and recruitment of more soldiers. Chris overlooks this squad of men and asks if they received basic training. Grappe says that they've been trained already for a month. Chris raises his arm and tells the soldiers it's time for their first mission. All of you get a shovel and assemble. Grappe looks a little nervous and asks Chris what he's planning to do, but Chris just smiles. He's trying to find the treasure. The group begins digging holes outside, and Chris is starting to get annoyed. He was sure that the thing he's looking for was somewhere around here. A man asks what the hell Chris is doing, and even if he is a duke, this might be pushing it for some people. Chris asks if this man is the feudal lord of this region, and the guy says he's Viscount Cloester. Chris says as far as he knows, this is a barren land, and he can't cultivate anything whatsoever. And if he can allow Chris... To continue his work, he will grant him a fertile land where he can farm. The man is shocked at his proposal. Chris says he only needs two days, but all of a sudden, screaming is heard. Did you see a soldier with bright red eyes? Chris smiles. It seems like they found it already. The soldier starts to pick a fight and looks at his fellow comrade, saying that he's about to kill him, and the two men begin to fight. Chris watches on and tells Digo that those two can't hear them. This is a brainwashing effect. It's pretty strong, isn't it? He tells Digo to go in there and stop them. Digo whoops their ass and carries them back. Chris orders for all of the soldiers except for Digo and Royce to evacuate the pit immediately. Chris asks for a shovel and starts to dig. After a while, he found what he was looking for. Chris calls for Digo and asks if he wants a cool weapon instead of his old crappy one. Digo says that he's up for it and Chris tells him to put his hand in the hole. 
Chris thinks the name of this land is the Bloodstained Plains. While cultivating, a farmer found an artifact in this region, and it turned him into a berserker. And according to legends, he killed hundreds of people, before he was finally subdued when the Wise Knights stepped in. All of a sudden, Digo's arm begins to swirl with a blood-like texture, and an axe forms in his hand. This is a cursed artifact imbued with an evil spirit. Executioner Guillotine. It starts to flood Digo with negative thoughts. I need blood. Kill all humans. But Digo isn't impressed, and is actually happy happy that this axe is for me, and thanks Chris for the gift. And this shocks the axe, and I guess it has a personality. Chris smiles and tells Digo that that's all his. With his fortitude, he won't be brainwashed too easily. Royce gets a little discouraged and asks if there's any other weapons, maybe something for me. Chris tells him not to worry, they're gonna look for another one as well. Chris thinks to himself that they're gonna reclaim all of the artifacts that were found in the land of Sercardo in his past life. We shift back to the royal palace, and the nobles try to throw some shade on Chris, saying that all the local lords are complaining about him. He's trespassing, doing whatever he wants. The nobles start to complain, telling him that he can't just ignore this problem, they need to take Duke Proudman and punish him. Eric doesn't seem amused and asks if they have a problem with Chris, then maybe he should send them as an envoy to the dukedom to resolve the grievances. Marquis Fortense, the head of the aristocracy, tells the prince that the duke is abusing his power. He gets serious and asks if Eric is the king or is it Chris? Elowan coughs in awkwardness as Eric says that of course he's the king. The Marquis says if that's the case then why don't you summon Chris here at once? Eric just sighs and he was planning to do that anyways and he knows that Chris is busy but he should at least pay me a visit. He relays the order for the duke to come here and if the nobles have a problem with him they need to tell him in person. The Marquis has a wicked smile and says he will do as his lord commands. We shift back to Chris and Royce, and they're in a cave somewhere, and they uncovered another artifact, the sword Quake. It was made by an expert craftsman. Royce starts to get excited and asks if this is for him, but Chris lets him down, saying that it's for Ellis, because it is a rapier after all. Royce asks when he is going to get something. We see Chris's men clearing the way from some low-level monsters, and Chris tells them not to retreat, attack all of the goblins. All of a sudden, a huge ogre appears, and Digo rushes in. The ogre yells, but with one slice, Digo chops the monster's head in two, amazed at his new weapon. Chris thinks to himself that everyone here and Digo need to ingrain this experience into their minds, because soon, they will face a war entirely of a different magnitude. Two years from now, they will be here. The great invasion that will shake the entire continent, the Orc Wave. We see the meeting of the nobles that are trying to fill the power vacuum caused by Desilio's death. It's now their chance to rise to power, and they even have the queen backing them. They toast the good times ahead, and now the world will finally know their names. We shift back to Chris looking at a weird cave entrance, and this is the dungeon that has various monsters inside. Royce wonders if there's a weapon for him in this cave, and he really wants to get a cool one already. Chris tells him to be patient, they're not going to go through that entrance, but a secret one on the back of the mountain. This dungeon has only one entrance, and if you dive in looking for treasure, you will surely fail. Even the Dungeon Hunter Guild gave up on it. Digo asks how Chris even knows about this. He just says a crappy lie, not wanting to give up his main character buff. He was actually in the guild who challenged this dungeon countless times in his previous life. The group approaches a tree with red roots, and Chris thinks that the entrance that is shown is actually a trap. The treasure is in the back of the dungeon. He orders his boys to start digging at the tree, and they do so and stumble upon a box. Chris opens it and sees a chain with a cross, a hero artifact that was made by the dwarves. It has some magical properties. Royce is begging to have it, but Chris tells him to back off. This is mine. Royce starts to get angry, begging Chris to get him something cool already. But interrupting the two, Murdoch comes delivering an important message. The royal palace ordered the presence of Duke Proudman. We shift to Chris walking into the palace not giving a fuck and he's ordered to go in alone. Chris enters the hall and is immediately hit with slander on all sides, calling him a traitor. Chris defends himself and he said he never tried to kill anyone or tried to betray his kingdom. He is solely focused on restoring his land. Chris begins to smile. Surely he wasn't called here just for this, right? and asks who the man is who called him, and we are introduced to the Marquis Poltens, brother of the Queen. We see a fan favorite, Eric, laughing in the room. The Marquis tries to order his men to capture Chris, but Chris isn't having any of it, and starts to yell at this bozo. Stop abusing your power in front of the prince. The Marquis tries to call for his guards, but they aren't stupid enough to attack Chris, he is the battlefield hero. 
Chris gets to the point and says that the General of Tegas isn't fully allied with Sarcardo, and the Eight Gates are aiming for Sunset Hyde. We are on the brink of destruction. Is this the time to be worried about power? What the hell are you nobles even thinking about? Putting yourselves before your country. Don't think the wealth from Tegas will save your lives. Because I, Chris, declare that anyone who betrays this country will be punished severely. Chris slams the table, causing all the nobles to be taken aback. We shift to a meeting with Count Elowan, Zighal, and Chris. The two counts support what Chris said, and Zighal asks about his daughter. Chris tries to take a sip of his tea, but notices a scent. He brings out a packet and confirms that his tea has indeed been poisoned, shocking the counts near him. Chris knows that this is a high-end poison, and only one clan can be responsible. But before he can think any more, some assassins come breaking through the door and start aiming their crossbows. Chris flips over the table next to him for cover and throws it at the assailants. Two more assassins try to impale Chris with spears while he is dodging arrows. But Chris catches the arrows in midair to save his two comrades. But saving the two counts, he is hit with two more arrows. But they deflect off him. It seems that Chris has prepared his vest to be resistant to projectiles. The assassins are now stunned as Chris breaks an arrow and throws it out of the window. The assassins try to attack again, but Chris remembers that he has his own assassins under him, as Rachel and the Hundred Daggers come in and deal with these amateurs. Rachel inspects the bodies of the assassins and is shocked to find out that they are from the Eight Gates. Elowan and Zighold are shocked, and Fox tells Chris that there were no guards patrolling this area. When Chris hears this news, he is disgusted. These nobles will sacrifice their own country for power. Chris hoped that these men would have understood the situation they were in due to the Civil War. But it seems Chris has to do something else. He can't just kill these officials, but instead, he'll put them on a leash. We see the Marquis walking with a guard, and they don't have an update on the assassination attempt just yet. The Marquis enters his room and tells the guard to be on standby. But as soon as the man closes the door, Rachel puts a dagger to his throat and kicks him to the floor. The man mistakenly thinks that Rachel is a part of the Eight Gates assassins that he sent and asks if the job is done. Rachel doesn't answer the Marquis and tells him to listen to everything that she says or else. Send a raven saying the operation was successful, and also in the message say that the duke is missing. The Marquis is worried about what will happen if he does this, but Rachel doesn't give him any choice, and the only way he will live is to comply. The next day comes and Eric gets the news that Chris has gone missing. Erewhon confirms this news and tells Eric that an assassination attempt has occurred. The prince is now furious and orders for his army to be mobilized. All forces will search for Chris, and the bastards who are responsible will pay. We shift to Zighal talking with the Grand Master of the Royal Guards, who is shocked to hear that assassins from the Eight Gates attacked them. How can their defenses be so weak? Zighal tells this man that his daughter has the ability to spot any traitors, but he needs his support in order to enact it. The man thinks about it and agrees. This is to protect the royal family. Zighal thinks that if the Grand Master colluded with the Marquis, he would not have accepted this offer. So right now, suspicion is off of him. Everything is going according to Chris's plan. We shift to the Eight Gates city, Wolfziano, and a surge of pilgrims are arriving as the soldiers watch on. We see a familiar face, Perth, and he notices someone in the crowd. He asks the man to remove his hood, and he does so, and introduces himself as Nora Devon. Is there a problem? Perth says the man is good to go, but thinks that he felt an insane amount of energy emanating from this stranger. Perth thinks that someone like that also is an Ediniano. We shift to this new city location, and we're in the Blue Dragon Clan's castle. A messenger tells the king that they need to retake the wolves' den as soon as possible. The king sorte the eighth size. They lost a sizable amount of troops in their last expedition, and right now they need to conserve their strength. But his advisor is still advocating for war. How can they sleep with Sir Cardo right on their doorstep? Another matter is pressing. They need to stop the rivalry between the Blue Dragon and the Gold Clans. They need to figure this out before they invade other countries. The man thinks to himself, and if he can convince the king to lead his country into war, then he will fulfill his mission and will return to the Northern Empire to report his success. And no wonder the Eight Gates sucks balls. They're getting played from the inside. The man walks off, but it seems our king isn't so gullible. Three days pass and three hooded figures enter a room, and a girl guides them to their destination. They walk down a set of stairs and meet the king of the eight gates. The man takes off his hood, and it turns out Yvonne is actually freaking Chris. And why does he look so weird? This is kind of bothering me. We shift back to Elowan's mansion, and he hands an item to Royce, saying it's from the Duke. Royce is excited that he finally gets a cool weapon, and this was something Elowan got a long time ago. But due to the weapon's weird shape, no one ever wanted to use it. Royce pulls out his new red katana and is amazed, and names it Single Edge. Erewhon hands a message from Chris. His orders are to relay the message. We shift back to Chris's weird face, meeting 
meeting with the King of the Eight Gates. This man thinks that Chris looks different from all the tales, but Chris manipulated his appearance with herbs. And the king tells Chris that he's been a thorn in his side, and someone from a different state wanted to take care of this thorn, but wanted the wolf's stronghold in return. Do you think I should take this deal? Chris isn't amused and switches to a serious tone, and tells the king to cut the bullshit. If he trusted that man, this meeting would have never happened. The king's attendant is angered by the disrespect, all the king wants to do is get rid of a green-eyed stranger. It is revealed that 10 years ago, a man appeared, the so-called green-eyed stranger, Junberg, and he revived the eight gates. He is the disciple of the frozen-blooded strategist, Angzing Lysonis. The king knows this man pretends to fight for the glory of the eight gates, but he is slowly expanding his influence in the country, and soon the land will be lost. Chris is amazed by the king's intellect, and it seems that Sorte the Eighth was in fact a great man. He would have been a great king if it wasn't for the orc invasion. Chris says he has one condition, and if the king will agree to this, he will make this stranger leave on his own two feet. The king obliges. Chris says the first step in this plan is restoring the relationship between the Eight Gates and Sir Cardo. Sorte thinks Chris means a non-aggression pact, but actually Chris wants an alliance. The king knows there might be pushback from allying with the enemy, but right now they need to stabilize the region in order to prosper. The king smiles and welcomes Chris Proudman to the Eight Gates. We shift back to Proudman's men racing up a hill, and soon they're going to arrive at their destination. Lynn recalls the orders given by Grappe, and Roy, Stigo, and Ellis were sent to train and used their artifacts freely, while Lind was sent into the mountains with a group of men to nurture elite warriors. In these mountains, there is a mission. Lin reaches the top and tells his men to organize the supplies. Lin looks at the map knowing his objective is here, but quickly snipes a bird out of the air. Lin sniped a messenger crow. He splits his men into two groups. One will bring supplies every night, and the other will shoot arrows until they can hit the crows, and train until they can hit these targets while running. One of the soldiers asks how long they will have to stay here, but Lin just looks back and smiles. At least six months. We are now at the Green Dagger Clan's Ars Jundberg's mansion, and it's been days since his crows have been returning his messages, not only from Sir Cardo, but also from the entire Northern Empire. Also, the king's movements have been unusual. The man thinks that he may have made a mistake. He turns to a woman behind him, asking if she pulled some kind of trick. The woman says she has always followed his orders, but the green-eyed man shuts the door, telling the girl that if she ever betrays him, he will feed her to the dogs. Interrupting Junberg is his attendant saying that a guest has come to see them, as you see Chris using the alias Nord. He greets Sir Junberg. Ars quickly notices the green eyes and hand gestures coming from Chris, and assumes that he is from the Northern Empire. Ars asks why Chris is here, and he lies saying that he's under orders. This makes Ars start to think that what happened is the Empire is planning to get rid of him because of his failure, or maybe he's being replaced. He comes back to his senses and tells Chris to come back later. Chris starts to notice the anxiety from this man. He won't need to prepare a poison, because even a meeting as simple as this has poisoned the man's mind. The poison of insecurity. We shift to a town in Oaken in the eastern continent, and a farmer is plowing the fields, as his wife asks him when they think their children will return. The man thinks that it must be several months, because it takes a while to reach the central continent. A man in the distance walks towards the two, but as they wave, they get a chilling sight, seeing the man on his last legs, with blood dripping from his face. He tries to warn the older couple to run away, but he falls to the floor. Instead of listening, they run towards him, and the husband gets an axe to the mouth. The wife is in shock seeing her husband dead, and an orc emerges from the forest and screeches at the top of its lungs. And we can only assume what happens to that poor lady. The green-haired stranger starts to get worried. It's been three weeks since Chris arrived. If he is the new agent sent by the Empire, does that mean I've failed? And why have they not ordered for me to be eliminated yet? He asks his attendant what Chris is doing, and is informed that he met with the Gold Clan a while ago. And right now, we shift to see Chris sparring in the Blue Dragon Clan's outdoor training field. We see the leader, Nova Dragon, surprised by Chris's spear technique. A man wants to know who this is, but Nova whispers to the girl next to him that Chris's identity is hidden. So they just say he is an envoy from the Northern Empire. Chris stops sparring with one of the men and they shake hands after an intense match. The arrogant young knight asks Pike if he's not ashamed. If he lost in the Blue Dragon clan would be ashamed. Alaire, the girl next to Nova, steps up and asks Chris to spar. But he just says that he's tired. We shift back to Ars, stressing over Chris. He is sparring with the Blue Dragon Knights? This clan has been rejecting my offers this entire time. And this new guy won them over like that? The king of the Blue Dragon clan must have heard something about Nord. Ars tells his attendants to prepare his carriage. Chris sips his tea with the king, thinking about Ars, and how he had someone tailing Chris to gather information. 
But this only works to Chris's advantage. The more he is watched, the more anxious Ars will become. Ars arrives at the king's chamber, but the guards don't let him in, and tell them that there is a private meeting, which shocks the man even more. Chris sips his tea as his masterful plan evolves. Another envoy from the Northern Empire will gain influence, while Ars won't be able to hear from his own country. The pressure is starting to get to him, and, he, and the thoughts that he is abandoned by his country are starting to steep in. We time skip to six months later and Chris is seen whooping the young knight's ass as he begs for another round. Pike just laughs at his little brother and Nova asks Chris for a word. The time has come. Ours is looking for you. We shift to the meeting between the two and Ours looks like he hasn't slept in weeks and tells Nord that this is a safe space. Chris notices the people waiting behind the curtains and knows that this is an ambush. Ours is getting reckless. The man starts and says for the past six months, he has been here, and the Empire must want you to gain all of my power, right? Chris doesn't answer, knowing that Ars will convince himself on the truth that he ultimately believes. The man rattles on that this is like their master, to punish me for my mistakes. It's been so long and he still doesn't have control of the Eight Gates. Ars thinks that Nord was sent here to join forces with him to seize the capital, right? But before he can continue, Chris tells Ars that the Empire is waiting for him. This is from Lord Angzing. He said to judge the situation, the Empire is aware of your hard work. Ars starts to smile. No way his Empire forgot about him. He agrees and will return. Chris smiles and nods, but asks for one more favor. Can you hand me the captive in that room? Ars agrees and he doesn't need that bastard anymore, and hands Chris the key. Chris enters the room and the person immediately notices that Chris is a specialist with herbs. Are you here to release me? Chris is and knows this person's real name, Pin Srey. Chris introduces himself and this girl is a half-elf, who will become the most respected pharmacist of her time, and the teacher of Chris in his past life, who taught him herbalism. A few days pass and Ars return to the Northern Empire and he arrived at the gate. The soldiers don't recognize him and Ars starts to get mad, but Lord Angzing looks over from the walls, asking why he is here. The confusion starts to settle in as Angzing reveals the truth. There is no new envoy, and now, both of them know that they have been fooled. We shift back to Chris and the king who laugh over their small victory. Chris asks where the blue dragon knights are, but Sorte tells him that they were dispatched a little while ago. Chris is shocked to hear that they were sent. But what shocks Chris is when he hears that they were sent to deal with an orc group in the east, and he starts to get worried. He asks for more information. Sorte says that a great number of orcs are charging from the east, but Nova is leading the men in order to defend. Chris asks when they left, and it was about three days ago. Chris starts to get stressed, asking if at any point in the last three days did Sorte lose contact with Nova. This confuses the king, which makes him ask Chris why it matters. But now that he thinks about it, they haven't replied to any messages just yet. This news causes Chris to fall into a deep despair. Chris needs to calm down. There should be another full year before the orc's main force arrives. But he needs to get involved, to make sure that nothing has changed from his previous life. Sorte asks if something's wrong, but Chris needs to be careful about what he says. Too much information could confuse the king. Chris tells him that it's nothing, but he's interested in the orcs and asks to go himself. Sorte tells Chris that he can do whatever he wants, but before Chris can leave, he turns to tell the king not to forget the agreement with Sercardo. Sorte says that he won't, and we shift to Fix eating some cookies that Chris made, and she's loving them. Chris is writing a letter to Proudman, and this might be the last letter he ever sends, if he doesn't make it back. Fix asks Chris why he's so kind. He doesn't even owe her anything, and yet he's feeding her cookies and released her from her bindings. Chris can't tell her the real reason she was released, but just tells Fix that she's pretty cute. This girl gets closer and wants to remove Chris's costume. It's almost about time to change it. But Chris doesn't have time to worry about these things. He suits up ready to leave, shocking Fix. She notices the poison that he has and asks who he needs to kill. Chris looks serious and says there's one thing he's preparing to do and prays that it doesn't happen. We shift to Nova and his men outside Edeniano, one of the eastern cities, looking at a huge army of orcs. They've been there for three days and the orcs haven't moved. Nova just hopes that this year the battle will go smoothly and Arthur suggests that they attack first. The intellect of the orcs is low. They won't charge in until they're hungry. Nova asks about the messages he was sending, but still, there is no reply. Something has to be up. It's never taken this long to reply. But shocking the men is siege equipment being rolled out. Nova yells for his men to prepare the ballistas and is shocked on how the orcs manage to get their hands on things like this. We shift to Chris making his way to Nova and calls for Pumpkey. 
He rides in for a distance and then hops off. He spots some orcs. They are killing the messenger crows. How do they know these advanced tactics? The orc wave started faster than he planned. In the past, Emiliano, the capital, was captured in 10 days. And this was significant because Emiliano is a supply point for all routes throughout the 8 major cities of the 8 gates. So in other words, the entire country was lost. And now, Chris has a race against time. Chris prepares his weapon and Pumpkey hops out of the bush, biting one of the orcs. Chris comes behind another, smacking him in the face with a cloth. He won't be able to kill them with a dagger. He needs to kill them by aiming at their vital points. Two more orcs appear and Pumpkey charges up a fire shot. Chris dives in and dodges a fist and wraps his cloth around the orc's foot. He takes the opportunity to put Wise into his dagger to finish the monster off. Chris continues riding and thinks that if the orcs are cutting off messengers, then it means Adiliano is still safe and the wise knights of the blue dragon clan are strong warriors. Chris spots more orcs and is shocked to the large army that they've amassed. Dealing with these foes himself will be too much, but why are they heading in the opposite direction of Eden Liano? But then it hits him. If the orcs are heading to the capital right now, they're using the army at the eastern city as bait. Their main force is heading for the capital and that's the reason it fell so quickly in his past life. The blindfolding tactic. This was their goal from the start. Five days pass and a group of orcs are being baited to the smell of meat. One of the orcs says that they'll be punished if they eat it, but his friend will just hide the evidence by eating everything. But this is actually Chris's trap, as you see the meat has been poisoned. The two orcs immediately die after consuming it, and this was all of the poison Chris had, and he's running out of tricks. Also, his eye color will soon revert. Chris needs to hurry up and move the blue dragon knights back to the capital. There's only five days left. We see Nova looking at the orcs and they still aren't moving. What on earth are they planning? The girl next to him noticed the decreased number of orcs, but Arthur spots someone coming to the north gate. It's Nord. They see Chris and know he's been fighting orcs. Nova asks for the situation, but Chris says that thousands of orcs are advancing to the capital right now. This news shocks Nova, and Chris tells the group that these orc bastards are going for an advanced tactic. They're gathering troops here to distract you, with their main target being Emiliano. Nova starts not to believe Chris's words, but Chris yells at the man telling him that this is urgent. If Emiliano falls, the entire country will follow. Arthur puts his sword next to Chris's neck, but Chris calmly explains that the orcs are intercepting the messenger crows. Come on, Nova, you can feel it. We need to do something. Nova asks Hilaire to bring his spear. They will put down these orcs first and return to the capital. Chris says that he will join them. The gate opens and Nova's force charges at the orcs, and they retaliate, and the battle commences. Both sides are losing men, and Chris activates his wise powers, telling these orcs to shut the fuck up. He ducks under a swing from one of them and dashes around the hulking monster. The orc tries to slam its fists on Chris, but he dodges again. The orc smashed the ground. What strength? What the hell is this? But Chris has no time to think, as another orc is ready to cut him down from behind. But saving Chris is Nova, using his spear to impale the orc in the face. Nova won't let Chris die here. He then yells for his men to show these monsters the true meaning of fear. Another wave of orcs call for their god, Holon, and start turning red. They've gone berserk. The army retreats and uses their castle defenses to snipe down the orcs. And suddenly, Pike returns, telling Nova that there's grave news. The orcs are headed towards Emiliano. We shift back to the capital, and a rock is hurled at the castle wall, killing the poor soldiers who thought they'd have an easy day. The orc invasion shocks the king. How are they here? Another report says an, a large army from Sercardo was seen in front of the western city. Sortan thinks that this must be the duke's doing. He orders the Platinum and Black's clans at Wolvesiano to confirm Sercardo's army, and the other clans to protect the capital. He needs to think calmly. No matter which enemy he needs to face, Chris and Sorte will protect their country, no matter what. Chris continues slaughtering the orcs and is getting more XP than usual. Maybe this means that the system treats orcs as more high-end opponents. And if that's the case, Chris will need to make an effort to kill as many as he can. Nova and his boys are not relenting and start targeting the siege equipment. The orcs turn to their captain for orders and they begin to retreat. Nova knows that this is not the time for celebration and tells his men that they need to go back to protect the capital. Pike and his men are ordered to stay and defend the gate, and the rest will return. Nova knows that the path back to the capital will be infested with orcs, but Chris knows a shortcut. We shift to the wolves' gate border, and Sorte and his knight move to see the army that are at their gates, and is shocked to see Chris's large force. Did he foresee what is about to happen? Perth wonders if Duke Proudman is here, but obviously he isn't. Sorte wonders who the representative will be as he opens the tent, and he's shocked to see Eric, as this little bastard greets the king of the eight gates. We shift back to four days ago, while Erewhon was explaining the situation to Eric. He begins getting angry, ready to invade the Eight Gates, but Erewhon tells him to calm down and explains Chris's plan. We shift back to the present and see the fruits of Chris's labor. Perth and Digo exchange glances and make some small talk. 
They did meet on the battlefield before. Perth wanted to see Chris and beat him this time, but it looks like that won't be happening. Digo flares up his aura and tells the man that he needs to go through him first. We don't see the conversation between the kings and we go back to Chris leading the troops through the forest. The young knight questions why an envoy of the Northern Empire is doing this, and even Nova is listening to his advice. Chris charges in with the 200 cavalrymen, wondering if it'll be enough to buy time. But his experience bar is continuing to rise. What's going on? All he is doing is riding Pumpkey. Arthur turns to see Chris's makeup start to fade. We shift to Emiliano's outer castle gate, and the defenses are being smashed. Rocks continue to be catapulted, destroying the castle walls, making some holes for the orcs to pour through. The men retreat into the inner castle wall, but over the horizon, the men spot Chris and his cavalry charging in. Chris is making his way, but feels his body begin to change with every step. He's overflowing with energy. This must be from the experience that he's gaining, and right now, he might be able to use it. Chris throws his spear to Elaire and rides forward. A huge orc sees the troops coming and throws a huge boulder right at Chris. It hits him dead on, but Chris is unfazed. He takes off his helmet and holds his necklace. This is an artifact sealed by shape-changing magic. Chris starts to channel his aura into it, and suddenly, a spear bursts from its restraints, and Chris uses it to cut the towering ogre in two. This is the legendary spear, Dragon Slayer. The blue dragon knights support Chris, and Arthur knows that Chris is hiding his real identity. But at least he's not an enemy. Chris just smirks at Arthur and the two are surrounded by enemies. They slash down the orcs one by one, but another wave is flooding in. Chris is cutting down orcs left and right, but there are too many. They are losing ground. The blue dragon knights are starting to fatigue. At this rate, they might face some casualties. Arthur is pushed to the ground as an orc is sending the finishing blow, but a familiar figure comes dashing in as Royce uses his new weapon to kill the orc in a flash. Digo's axe comes flying in, triggering a rage in all of the surrounding orcs. Chris's backup has arrived, and they let Chris know that a peace treaty between Sercardo and the Eight Gates has been signed. All allied forces gathered at the gate. Duke Proudman's army joined the battlefield. We see Erwan riding in with Eric and Guillen behind him. Sorte is also charging in with his troops, and the allied force is ready to repel this threat. The orcs are not going down without a fight, as they call to their god, and start smashing into the allied army. Nova yells for his troops to protect their king, and Lind approaches with his elite unit, apologizing for being late. They begin raining down arrows into the orcs, but Nova thinks that normal arrows are useless against these creatures. But Lind's men have been trained vigorously, and their accuracy is second to none, as they pierce through the eye sockets of all the incoming orcs. Digo uses Lin's volley to charge in with Ellis and starts chopping down orcs with ease. Lin continues to fire and Gien and Doki are also showing off their moves, leaving Nova in awe. Is this the famous army of Proudman? These guys are making the orcs look like cannon fodder. Nova uses this sight to boost the morale of his own troops. They won't lose to these Sercardo bastards. Chris is feeling himself and now the tide has been turned. But right as he thinks to continue, he falls to the floor. His vision starts to blur. His wise is at its limit. Lin helps his boy up, but a jacked orc with a huge sword begins to roar, for it's God, a giant orc. Chris thinks that these types didn't appear until the second wave. Why is it here now? Lin tells Chris not to worry. His knights will take care of this. Chris tells Lin to be careful. It might be on par with a wise knight. But Lin just laughs, telling his lord to have more faith in the Knights of Proudman. All of Chris's boys gather around the humongous creature, and Lind calls out to them. Digo, Gien, and Doki will take care of the smaller orcs, and the rest will focus on this raid boss. The three vanguard chop the orcs down with ease, and Lind and Royce dash in with weapons in hand. The giant orc raises its sword, ready to squash these insects, and it slams its weapon down, causing the earth to rupture. Lind uses Duke Rold's artifact and freezes the ankle of the giant orc. Royce follows up, slicing its leg in two. The orc lost its balance and begins to fall on its face, and the last thing that it sees is Ellis ramming her artifact into its head, killing it in one blow. Ellis receives praise from all the Sercardo troops, calling her Bellona, a mythological figure, the warrior goddess. These compliments make Ellis blush, so flattering. Ellis raises her artifact and tells the troops to follow Bellona to battle and kill these orcs. The orcs ended up being defeated and the remnants retreated. Chris watches on, exhausted, but he did it. He stopped the first wave. Some time passes and both kings, along with Chris and the blue dragon knights, are sitting at the strategy table. Eric is laughing, telling Sorte that now he owes him one city, just like they promised. But Sorte just sighs. That wasn't part of the deal. Nova tries to calm Sorte down, but Eric keeps bugging him. Come on, you have eight cities, just give me one. The two start barking back and forth at each other, ready to fight outside. Sorte can't stand Eric's relaxed attitude, and Eric dares Sorte to square up. 
Chris tells the two of them to calm down. The orcs are not done their invasion. This army came through Oaken of the Eastern Continent. And now that they made a path, they're going to keep coming. And just like humans, orcs also have their hierarchy. They have three classes, and each level has stronger warriors. The wave they experienced right now was second class warriors, and they can fight up to wise knights. First class warriors were not even involved in the raid. And after seeing the second class warriors fail, the first class might begin their assault. They need to prepare. Some time passes and Chris is back in his tent and Lind walks in, asking him if he's okay. Chris says he is, but knows that his body is reaching his limit. If he doesn't rest, the wise energy will continue to destroy his body. Wise isn't something you can use without consequence. It will have repercussions one day. Chris wants Nova to teach him the wise technique of the Blue Dragon Clan, but Lind thinks that that's impossible. Just because they're allies now doesn't mean that he will give away the clan secrets. Chris laughs. If you won't give them to me, then I'm going to have to steal them. Lin gets worried about what Chris is about to do, but Chris just smiles. He's confident in his plan. Eric asks Chris if he's serious about sending him back, but Chris knows that if Eric stays any longer, he might ruin the peace that he tried so hard to establish. Chris comes up with some witty excuse telling him that the citizens of Sir Cardo wouldn't be at peace if their king wasn't there. Eric blushes and agrees with Chris, so tells Erewhon that it's time to return. Chris bows and says goodbye to his majesty, and actually sets off himself. He turns towards Nova and tells him to come along. Nova uses this opportunity to speak privately with Chris, asking if he can speak freely. He knows that Chris has f some great knights that are all able to use the wise ability double, and asks Chris if he has reached the fifth stage. Chris tells him that he hasn't yet, and the fifth stage is the wall for most wise users. And only two people in the continent have surpassed that wall of being a superhuman, Guillen and Abel. Chris has been training ever since the Civil War, but his wise is stuck at level 48. But his goal right now isn't reaching the fifth stage. Wisers are gifted with a unique power depending on their training method. Chris and his wise knights have the power, Tempest Tower. It's its biggest strength that it can be used to get instant explosive power. But there's a limit to using it continuously. And currently, Chris's physical condition can't sustain this power for a long time. And right now, it's causing him a lot of damage. Chris can't keep pushing himself the way he is. But, on the other hand, the Blue Dragon's clan's wise, Dragon Rose, creates two emblems on the wiser's back. And it specializes in prolonged use of wise, as it steadily releases power. And that's the kind of wise technique that Chris needs to learn now. You'll have to get it, no matter what. We shift back to the troop assembly area, and Chris is meeting with two of the officials, asking if everyone has gathered yet. The Platinum Shield clan and the Black Lion clan are not here yet, and they're having a hard time fighting the orc army. Chris understands and gets the news that a scout was sent to the terrain around Ediniano, and orcs are headed that way, about 10,000 of them. Chris knows that at this speed, they'll arrive by tonight. One of the commanders tells the group that they should not fight the orcs at night due to their adapted eyesight. But Chris doesn't agree. He wants to start the battle as soon as possible. And he has a plan. And asks Lin if he brought all the materials that was entrusted to Grop. Lin says that everything is prepared. And Chris quickly turns to Nova, telling him to gather straw and dried grass until the sun sets. Nova is confused but sends his men to work. We shift to night time and the orcs sound their horn and begin their charge. Nova stands ready to intercept and tells his men to light the fires. All of a sudden, tens of torches start lighting up in front of the castle wall, illuminating the area. The orcs are stunned momentarily and the soldiers use this opportunity to charge at them. Nova and his men start making quick work of the orcs and even Perth charges in to join the fight. Nova tells his men to hold their positions and not to get pushed back. He flashes back to Chris's instruction as he told them to get as much attention as possible. The orcs are getting enraged as they start targeting the torches. They start to push the eight gate army back. The men are starting to get slaughtered as the eight gates cannot withstand much longer. Nova sees what's going on and tells his men to retreat to the castle gate. We shift back to the original plan as one of the commanders says that fighting the orcs at night is suicide. Darkness is like a living room for the orcs. Chris thinks they need to do something because they won't win the war by only attacking the orcs in the sunlight. But suddenly a rumble is heard in the distance as the orcs turn to see an army compiled of chariots. Chris starts to smile. If they can win in the darkness, then they'll really have an edge on this war. The first chariot rides in, slashing many orcs in its wake. And Chris arrives with the chariot troops. They charge in and start decimating the orcs. The people on the chariots also have an order to throw straw on the corpses of the orcs and light them on fire. This creates a natural wall of fire, separating the orcs from their reinforcements. Chris looks past this wall and tells the orcs to hurry up. Come and get us. The leader of this troop wonders if that was the man who killed the previous army. One of the lackeys tells him that it is, and the leader tells the orcs that it's time 
to retreat. The troops watch on and it seems they won this night. Tigo wonders if they should chase down the orcs, but Chris knows that they won't gain anything from that. He thinks to himself that this orc had superior judgment. He saw that he was losing the battlefield and didn't rush in recklessly. And that scares him because orcs are not supposed to have such a high intelligence. This war definitely won't be easy. We see the orcs returning and now there's a change of plan. They're only going to be able to win this war after they kill the strategist, Chris, the man with golden eyes and bluish black hair. They need to kill him at all costs. An axe is hurled onto the ground, but Roy dodges. He slices the head off of the orc, and this battle has lasted for four days. The orcs keep coming. Chris and his men are desperately holding the defense. But in these four days, Chris has managed to copy two wise techniques. Nova's dragon wise and another technique that focuses wise into the legs that Perth utilizes well. The battle comes to an end for the day, but it seems the orcs have a plan to tire out the soldiers. The chariots are starting to break down, and Chris is noticing that his side is being hit harder than the others. We see Chris meeting with Nova, and the man brings up the idea to chase the orcs out. Surely they can win in a battle in an open field. Chris thinks that this would be possible, because as it stands, they are not winning this war of attrition. The main problem is, there has to be some sort of plan behind the orcs' attacks. Chris needs to find out what that plan is. He tells Nova not to be hasty, they need to wait for their remaining troops, before making this decision. The next day comes, and like the previous, the orcs charge in again. Chris notices that he himself is being targeted by the orcs. He uses his wise powers to chop tens of orcs in half. Chris's boys see him struggling and move in to help, and then Chris is escorted back to the tent. He curses himself, it's happening again. Most of the orcs are just flocking towards him. Are they aware that Chris is the mastermind? Because right now his wise is reaching its limit. His body won't hold up if he uses any more. The only thing that he can do is imprint the seal of the blue dragon. Chris starts the process and he has read all the books related to wise, but has never heard of someone being able to use more than one wise seal. This might be a gamble. But if it works, Chris's power will skyrocket. Chris starts to have new emblems envelop on his back, but there's no response. Chris gets discouraged that he won't make it work, but maybe it will just take some time. Suddenly, Lind opens the tent and calls for an emergency meeting. The orcs are moving. All the reinforcements have arrived, and we're introduced to the leaders of the Black Lion and Platinum Shield families. The orcs number 50,000, and it's the largest force that they have faced so far. The combined allied force meets them head on. Nova comments on the strange behavior the orcs have been displaying, and they were aiming directly for Chris. Perhaps they see Chris as the leader of this army. Chris says that they should have the same plan. They need to target the orc leader. He should appear once he believes the troops are exhausted. Chris thinks the orc leader will be in a place where he can survey the battlefield. So he wants to organize a special squadron to take his head. The leader of the Black Lions asks if this squad will be able to break through the orc's lines. Chris tells Gien to come in, and he's wearing some pretty badass armor. The men are shocked. Gien is donning a special set of wise knight armor. This can't be worn easily. Gien Ludwig is the strongest wise knight in Proudman. The squad to hunt the orc leader will be compromised of the strongest knights from each army. The soldiers from the eight gates will choose theirs accordingly. We shift to Proudman Castle and we see Agatha prick herself with a needle. She feels anxious but begins to pray to her god to bless Chris and his army. Chris stands in the pouring rain facing the countless number of orc savages. Chris thinks that the leader he is looking for won't be with the army since before the army was composed of different species like trolls and goblins. Chris knows who the leader should be and it was someone who caused a lot of damage in his past life, the one-eyed orc, Blacksword. The two armies start sizing each other up with Chris's force making up the center, the Proudman army on the right and the Eight Gates army on the left. And we see Gien in his chatted up armor leading the special task force. Chris hasn't mastered the blue dragon technique but he doesn't have time to think about that. As his troops are called to be ready to engage, the two sides begin to roar and the battle commences. Men and orcs alike are dying left and right, and like always, they are targeting Chris. But this time, he has Pumpkey by his side. The dog sets some orcs ablaze and Chris needs to save his energy, and fight without wise, at least for now. His knights are taking care of the orcs, but Nova and Ellis spot some mysterious black orcs. These are orcs that can use wise. Tigo and Lin are holding their own and Guillen charges in with the black and platinum leaders. Two orcs stand in Guillen's way, but he turns them into mince meat. Doki and Ellis are fighting some of the black orcs and they are much stronger than the regular ones. Black Sword is overseeing the battle and calls for the real battle to begin. Yen can't spot the orc leader, but all of a sudden a mysterious fog fills the arena and Black Sword tells Chris to stop. He's been surrounded. Chris notices that he's been separated from his help. He quickly turns to tell Royce to hold down this position and he rushes through the smoke to meet Black Sword. But as he's rushing through the smoke, a sword strike almost pierces his head. Ah boy. 
you have some good reflexes. Royce tries to reconnect with Chris, but four wise orc warriors stand in his way. Royce is going to be their target for now. Black Sword emerges from the fog. He knew Chris would be here, and now he will die. Royce knows the situation that he is in. He's surrounded by four second class warriors. He might have to use that technique. We flash back to Chris instructing his men of the arrow tactic. This is what is happening to Royce right now. The stronger warriors group up and annihilate key targets of their enemy. The basic composition is four second class warriors. The fight begins as the four orcs dash into Royce, and he knows that he is their target. Royce defends each strike, he's being pushed back. He remembers Chris's words, if you find yourself in this situation, use your full strength or run away. We shift back to Chris being face to face with Blacksword, confused on why he's here. Blacksword picks up on the confusion. Why, did you think I was hiding like some coward, you arrogant human? I can also target your back. Blacksword charges up his wise energy and prepares a strike for Chris. Chris blocks but the blow causes him to cough up blood. Pumpkey tries to defend his master but is smacked across the field. Chris yells out for his dog, but Blacksword appears behind him, telling Chris that he is weak. Chris barely parries the attack and has already sustained some heavy damage. Blacksword is the best warrior out of the orcs and is at a similar level to Chris. If Chris doesn't use wise, he won't win. We ship back to Royce, barely hanging in there, as he dodges another incoming fist. A spike club swings, sending him back a few feet. He can't see an opening. What can he do? It seems hopeless. Royce realizes that the true objective of these orcs are Chris, and that means he needs to hold them here to not interfere with Chris's battle. Royce's demeanor changes, ready to take on these savages. They charge in again, but Royce is more prepared to parry their strikes. He's interfering with their attack strategy. Louis Ilnoven. He's been wielding the sword since he was a boy, and after his parents died, he swore to be strong, to protect his sister. Maybe it was due to this desperation that drove him to train even through his terminal sickness, but he truly is the gem of the Ilnoven family. He awakens the ability judgment, which gives him the foresight to make the best decision in any situation. He took that latent ability of his family and made it his own. He can block an attack from any direction, in the most efficient way, as we see him take the orcs off balance, which each blow they try to send his way. The orcs are starting to get frustrated and charge in together. Right now, Royce is blooming like a flower, and this is the perfect training ground for him to perfect his special determination. He easily maneuvers out of their attack, and Royce tells these stupid orcs that they are the ones who fell into a trap, and Royce will keep them here until his life runs out. The orcs continue their assault on Royce, but still aren't able to get a clean hit. The anger is starting to build, and we shift back to Chris's fight, as he is using his full strength to take on Blacksword. The orc narrowly dodges Chris's spear, and comments on his nice weapon. Chris can't see an opening in this guy's defense. He has no wasted movement. And Chris still can't use his new wise powers. He needs to settle this now. He unleashes a barrage of stabs at the orc, but it has no effect. The two get into a fierce melee, but Chris slips a dagger right towards the orc's eye. Blacksword raises his hand to defend, and Chris uses this opportunity to slash the orc with his artifact. He was aiming for Blacksword's eye, but he missed. Chris needs to exploit the orc's blind spot, but this just makes Blacksword laugh. Do you think those weak tactics will triumph over me? Pathetic. Show me your next move. We turn back to Royce, who's been defending against these orcs for 10 minutes now, and the fatigue is starting to build. Humans aren't as physically gifted as orcs. Royce is starting to fade. The orcs capitalize on this chance, and a swing is coming down on our poor boy. Royce tries to dodge it, but he can't move out of the way, so he parries it instead, and the strike sends shockwaves through the air. But Royce still stands. He's missing part of his shoulder. The orcs praise Royce for his strength, but it wasn't enough. And now, it's all over. Royce falls into the wet ground, apologizing to his lord Chris and to his sister. I pray you don't grieve too much. Two orcs appear right in front of Royce, ready to end his life. But a flash of red intercepts as Guillen appears. Four orcs, an arrow tactic, huh? Guillen tells Royce he did an amazing job holding out this long, but now he'll take over. Black Sword is starting to savor the fight with Chris. He loves Chris's expression. His face is full of fear. It's the only face these pathetic humans can make. Chris blocks another attack, but his wise is starting to rip apart his body. He can't hold out any longer. Chris tries to get into position, but Black Sword dashes in again, striking Chris once more. Chris managed to dodge, but sees little hope in winning. He sends another powerful stab, but Blacksword sidesteps it with ease. The orc tells Chris that he's in a hurry, so he's gonna wrap this up. He sends Chris flying into the air, as he promises him that the orcs will rule this land. Chris hits the floor hard, battered and beaten. He can't move. His whole life flashes before his eyes. Is this how it ends? Chris starts to fade. He's so tired, he just wants to rest. Blacksword is gonna take Chris's spear as a trophy, but Chris manages to get back up telling the orc that this fight isn't over. Are you sure that this is enough? 
Black Sword is confused. Are you sure you tried everything? Because I still want to reach higher. Black Sword is amazed that Chris can still use energy and charges back in to rip the boy's head off. Chris pours all of the remaining wise energy he has and uses it on himself, shocking Black Sword. The surge of energy causes Chris to cough up blood as this intense force is ravaging his insides. He's trying to force his new powers to awaken, and all of a sudden, Chris disappears from Black Sword's sight. And now his body feels amazing. It's so light. It was like he was born again. His wise leveled up, and he's gained a new skill, as his aura changed to a bright yellow. His new power awakens. Dragon Rose. Black Sword rushes in at Chris, but in a single strike, Chris breaks both of his swords. Even Chris is baffled by his own speed, wondering if Black Sword is moving in slow motion. He dashes back in, making quick work of this once mighty orc. And now, Black Sword's expression changes as he fears for his own life. He yells and charges back in at Chris, but Chris twists Black Sword's words back at him, asking why he's dodging all of his attacks. Chris slams down on Black Sword, telling him that he likes his daggers and he will take them as a trophy. This enrages Black Sword as he calls out to his god and goes berserk. The two combatants' swords meet, and a huge explosion of black and yellow fills the area. The dust settles, and Royce rushes towards his lord, but he is shocked to see Chris a hair away from Black Sword's dagger. But his own spear impaled the mighty orc. Chris said that he will not run, but he never said that he was going to take the hit. The Proudman army erupts in cheers. Chris killed the enemy later. These screams fill the battlefield, and the orcs lost morale. And after two days of combat, they were eventually defeated. We time skip to a few days later, to Chris chilling with Pumpkey and Pixie, and she prepared some food for the good boy. Lynn interrupts, telling Chris that they have a message from Amelia Gates. The king is looking for him. Chris is riding Pumpkey, but all of a sudden, his foot lights up with Tempest energy, and his dragon rose energy starts flaring up as well. These two auras are fighting for control over Chris's body. But after a short delay, Chris's wise comprehension levels up to 50, and he is astonished. Wise powers can grow while stimulating each other? What a discovery. If he can imprint other wises, he'll be the strongest man to ever live. We shift to the meeting between Sorte and Chris, and Sorte thanks Chris for his help. It wouldn't have been done without him, and asks how he can repay this debt. Chris says that he needs something from the royal treasury to prepare for the future. Sorte wonders why Chris needs to prepare since the war is over, but Chris reminds the king that the orc lord still lives, and their fight is not over. The king of the orcs rules not only over his kind, but also over goblins, trolls, ogres, and giants. Defeating him will put an end to this war once and for all. Sorte agrees and Chris bows in thanks, but notices Sorte's distressed look. Sorte says that after this war, he wants Chris to serve him. Chris just smiles and tells the king that he should already know the answer to that question, and Sorte smiles. He's surprised that he actually said that out loud, and he wonders if he wants Chris that badly, or is he just scared of having him as an enemy? Chris is escorted to the treasury, but not long after, he finds what he was looking for. He takes some armor that looks like trash, and the attendant is confused on why he's taking this. It's just junk. We shift to nighttime, and Chris took two things from the treasury. The first is a magic powder that can heal any wound, called extra life, and the other is the armor. He throws the armor into a fire and thinks that there are rumors that the descendant of the dwarf who made dragon's flesh resides in the Eight Gates treasury, and this treasure has to be purified by fire to reveal its true nature. Chris dons the now bright armor, wise knight armor, Dragon Lin. The nickname of Stage 5 Wise is called Forgotten Weight, and this allows one to bear the weight of this exclusive armor. The armor finishes transforming to fit Chris's body, and it looks pretty sharp. Pumpkin notices something, and a dagger is thrown at Chris. He manages to dodge, but in the forest he sees a fairy, who greets Chris. Chris asks who this is, but the fairy just laughs and thinks Chris is a funny guy. He's not actually here to fight, but wanted to meet Chris Proudman. You see, someone wants to see you. Have you heard the name Angzing Leonis? Chris says that he is quite busy and the fairy starts to get serious, telling Chris that he will regret this decision. Make an answer. Chris stays silent and dashes towards the fairy, sending his spear inches from his face, telling him that this is his answer. The messenger gets to the point and goes to relay the message. Chris is concerned now because Anzing is the leader of the Northern Empire. And what would he possibly want from him now? The next day comes and Ellis is training in the Eden Gate Blue Dragons facility. And Alair approaches, telling Ellis that he likes strong women and wants to duel. And if he wins, he wants her hand in marriage. But damn bro, how about you take her to lunch first? The fuck's your problem? We see Chris returning to camp and he passes Royce. And he asks about his injury. It's getting better day by day and Royce should be okay. Chris asks where everyone went and we shift back to Ellis' duel. And she wipes the floor with the lair. Ellis mocks the man, but the leader of the Black and Platinum families arrive, asking to spar as well. Ellis gets fired up by the challenge, and Doki also wants in. And now the four start fighting all at once. They dash in quicker than the eye can see, and their battle begins. 
Chris arrives and watches on to this impressive display of wise. Royce comments that the battle looks pretty even. The leader of the Black Lion spots Chris and thinks that this is a perfect opportunity to show him the power of the Eight Gates. He sends Doki flying and Ellis turns to call for him. But the Platinum Leader is right behind her. She dodges the strike and goes to fight Delchen, the master of the Black Lions, with Doki. Chris is impressed that Delchen is holding his own against the two of them. That man is said to rival the Lance King. He sees the Black Lion engraving on his hand and the Platinum Shield crest on the abdomen. Both sides go in for a deciding strike but Nova arrives yelling at them to stop. A war is still looming. What are you guys doing? Dao Chen sighs and says that it was just a friendly spar, and she's his sword. He's quite disappointed that he couldn't show the difference in their power. Ellis says that if this was a real battlefield, the outcome would be different. But Dao Chen just laughs. Ellis sure has guts after all. We shift to the Edindiano defense meeting. Anova starts the conversation, saying the orc's movements have been shrinking, and their main objective now is finding the orc lord. Chris thinks that they need to find some info on the king, and he can't use his past life anymore since so much has changed. He has to use his own rationale. What is the best way to kill as many humans at one time? Interrupting his thoughts is a soldier bursting into the room, telling the group that a new report details a huge army of orcs on the move, and they've passed through the Red Canyon. Chris analyzes this situation, and the canyon is a passageway to the central continent. It seems the orcs don't want to drag this out. Delchen orders his men to move out and thinks back to Nova's message. The King Sorte specifically ordered Delchen to retrieve the Orc Lord's head. They cannot let Sir Cardo take all the credit. Chris meets with Pixie thinking about what is going on and notices a box and asks Pixie what's inside. She says it's something from Sir Cardo and Chris unboxes Moonlight and Sunshine, two prized artifacts, and he is happy with their arrival. Pixie is disappointed that there wasn't any food in the box and honestly, I can relate to that. But Chris asks her for a favor. The war is going to be more fierce and he's going to need her help. We shift to the orc's base as a huge ocean of orcs stand in front of their king. The king tells his men to calm down. They can't get too excited. And he asks the, he asks the elder next to him how the preparations are going and is informed that everything is ready. The king calls for all the chieftains to meet and we now see some new characters arrive and they're ready to trample all over these weak humans. Chris brings Doki and Gien and gives them their new artifacts. Gien is gifted the sword Moonlight that got its name from its mysterious shine. And Doki is gifted the Polaxe Sunshine. Both are special weapons that can harness the power of wise. Lin rushes into the tent telling Chris that the orcs appeared in front of Edeniano. Chris is now worried. What is the orc king after? The Eight Gates or Sir Cardo? Why are they splitting their forces? These plans are getting more and more complex. He doesn't want to fall into a trap. The orc king is not an easy opponent. Chris calls for his men to prepare because they're leaving to the Red Canyon. Nova left Elaire and some men to join Chris, but Elaire's real objective is to see if the orc lord is where Chris is going so he can inform Delchen. Elaire doesn't like his orders but swears by them. Chris is riding with his men through the forest and he is about half a day away. A new report arrives telling Chris that the orcs are waiting in the Red Canyon, possibly setting up an ambush. Chris thinks that he can't waste any more time and tells Pixie that it's time for her to go to work. They will start once they reach the forest. We shift to some orcs waiting in the forest in ambush, bored out of their minds, but all of a sudden, a green fog fills the area. It's a poisonous herb called green light. And this is what Chris and Pixie have been working on, to thin out the orcs. Now they won't have to waste time on these petty ambushes. Chris plans to utilize Pixie's talents from here on out. She was once the best poisoner in the northern continent. Chris continues riding and the orc army is right in front of him. He tells his troops to prepare for battle. The two sides engage and Chris and his men make quick work of this orc army. Gen and Doki test out their new weapons and they are in awe of their strength. The battle wraps up pretty easily and Chris is taken aback. This army is smaller than he anticipated. But all of a sudden, a beat up eight gate horseman appears from the rear, telling Chris that they have a problem. The orcs are breaking down the walls of Ediano. We shift to the battlefield and see some black orcs wreaking havoc on the poor soldiers. Nova is holding the line, but he's being pushed back. A goblin tries to stab him, but Delchen intercepts. They sent an envoy to Chris and are praying for backup. But in the distance, a murderous dark aura fills the battlefield, even shocking both of the Grand Knights. They can't move due to this intense killing instinct. This must be the Orc King. The King asks one question, who is your leader? Chris is now worried that he's been had by this distraction. The orcs were never planning on attacking Sir Cardo. This was a plot to divide Chris's forces. And if mutant monsters are attacking Ediano, then the orc lord has to be there. Chris tells his men that there's an emergency and they need to return back now. Everyone begins riding back and Alaire is now worried for his comrades. Chris tells them to relax and have some faith in his family. Chris thinks that they can return fast. But right as they exit the valley, a huge ogre blocks their path. An elite force springs an ambush. 
Chris's forces are being decimated, and one of the orcs points at Chris. But Digo rushes in ready to take care of this bastard. Chris orders for Lind, Digo, Ellis, and Royce to take care of these enemies, and the rest of his troops to follow him. Chris sees the damage his army is sustaining and vows that this time he will end this war. We shift back to Nova and Delchen facing the Orc Lord, confused on his question. The Orc Lord says that this war is meaningless, and he rules over every continent, and will make every leader of every race bow before him, and take full control over their species. This war has shown me that humans are quite resourceful, therefore I'll show you guys some generosity. Only the leader has to die, and the rest will be taken as my slaves. Daochan gets enraged and tells Nova that now there's a chance. Chris is not here. They will take this head together. The two dash in to either side of the Orc King, but the attacks don't phase him. Nova activates his wise, but the Orc King sends him flying with one strike. Delchun takes his chance to send a slash right at the king, but he blocks it with ease. Delchun is shocked by this monster's skill, but Delchun thinks that if him and Nova work together, then they can win. The Orc King laughs. Do you pathetic humans think you can kill me? The ground around the king erupts with his energy, taking both men off guard. The Orc King dashes into Nova, sending his weapon flying into the air. Nova is now helpless as the king bids him farewell, sending him flying into a nearby wall. The man coughs up blood, and the king asks if Nova thinks he's lucky to be alive. There is no luck. You only survived because I controlled my energy. You were merely a demonstration of my power. The monster turns towards Delcha and knows that this is the stronger knight. So maybe you're the leader. So I'm going to start with you. Then I'll make my way through all of the human leaders. Chris's knights are now fighting the orc ambush. But these are no weak foes. Second class at least. And the three-headed orc is a chieftain who is giving them some trouble. The monster blocks one of Lin's arrows and another orc tries to strike Lin from behind. Royce intercepts and cuts his arm off, but to his horror, the orc regenerates a new arm right in his face. Digo is taken aback. This orc has insane regeneration. They need to finish him in a single blow. This battle won't be easy. We shift back to Delchen's fight as the orc king rushes back in, wanting to take care of the leader of the Black Lions. The barrage leaves Delchon speechless at this orc's power, but he has no time to think. As the king leaps in again, the blow cracks the ground, but Delchon dodges. He won't last long at this rate. He needs to make a decisive blow. The orc king slashes his huge axe, but Delchon uses his chance to dash behind the king. But the orc just laughs and uses the same move back on Delchon, asking if this is what you call a surprise attack. Delchon manages to block the strike, but the sheer force sends shockwaves through his body. A follow-up punch sends Delchon flying towards a nearby rock, leaving a trail where his body was sent. The king thinks that this is the limit of the human body, and the difference between their species. Humans were never destined to win. The weak will always be ruled by the strong, and because of destiny, I will kill you. Farewell. But interrupting the party is a blue spear that flies right past the king's face. He turns to see Doki save an 8-gate soldier, and Chris and the reinforcements came just in time. Chris stands looking at the orc king in his new badass armor, looking like a freaking boss. I love it. The orc king recognizes his blue hair, and wonders if this is the one who annihilated his first army. Chris smiles, thanking the orc king for recognizing him. Delchan yells for Chris to be careful. This orc is on a different level. Chris tells Pumpkin to stay back, as these two titans stand ready to face off against each other. Chris assures the king that he won't break that easily, and he's going to make him regret ever invading this kingdom. The fight commences, and the king thinks that Chris isn't stronger than Delchen, and what he needs to be cautious of is that spear. The two exchange blows, but Delchen comes out of nowhere, trying to land a blow on the king. He tells Chris to be wary of the orc's fist. It can break almost any weapon. Chris analyzes the situation and knows that the orc king is very fast. It's going to be hard to find an opening. Chris tells Delchen to look for any opportunity to strike. He will keep the orc busy. Chris dashes in again, and the two let off strikes at each other that sends shockwaves into the air. The orc has a higher overall wise level than Chris, so he's not going to win with sheer power. He uses a jumping technique to take the orc off guard, and Delchan uses his chance to cut at the orc king. But he doesn't get deep enough, even after using his full strength. The orc king gets annoyed at these pesky flies and swats them away. Chris notices that the king changed his target to Delchan, and he has his weapon ready to end him. Chris puts all of the wise into his legs and intercepts the strike, but he fell for the king's trap as he is punched hard into the stomach and is sent flying. He gets back up but is damaged from that strike. The orc tells these humans that their fatal flaw is that they always help the weak, but he is impressed that Chris could withstand that punch. But this changes nothing. The orc charges in to finish Chris, but Pumpkin dives in and takes the slash meant for Chris. In a desperate attempt, it lets off a flame attack that sends the king back. Chris goes to Pumpkin's aid, but the cut is deep. 
The Orc King isn't amused by this display. And if that wolf didn't grow up with humans, it would have been the leader of a pack. If only it wasn't infected by your weakness, Chris. Chris gets up with his aura oozing, and he tells Delchon to watch Pumpkin. The Orc asks Chris if he plans to fight him without a weapon. But Chris tells the Orc to shut that mouth. The Orc is shocked, and Chris's energy starts to rise. He gains a new skill. He dashes in with a speed that is faster than the Orc King, and his power continues to rise as two more skills are unlocked. His blue and yellow aura are starting to combine, and even Delchon is in awe of Chris's sheer strength. He is now at a stage where he can manipulate Wise onto any part of his body at will, and Chris has reached the sixth stage of Wise as we see his proficiency raise to 60. The Orc King's demeanor changes, as now this fight is becoming more troublesome. Chris got a sudden power up, and now the King thinks that his Wise might be weaker by comparison. He starts to flare up his own aura, thinking that he will never be outdone by a mere human. Both combatants grab their weapons and lunge back in at each other. Their swords meet, and Chris mocks the Orc King. What happened to your calmness? Did you let a little human punch blow you away? The Orc King continues to become enraged, and his own power is starting to grow. The two disengage briefly and continue the fight. The battle is at a stalemate, with neither side getting an advantage. Chris gathers energy into his fist and punches the Orc King in the stomach, which makes him spit up some fluids. Chris asks him how he liked that one, huh? You think all humans are weak? The Orc King can't believe that he's being pushed back. He doesn't want to stay trapped because of these humans. And we flash back to when the Orc King was younger. And he asks his master why they are trapped in the outskirts of the continent. The old Orc tells the boy that the humans are scared of their existence and do not want them roaming around their territories. Their species also rules over land and form groups together. It would be wise not to underestimate them. This started the Orc King's vendetta against the humans. And he promised to kill them all for trapping him and his people in the barren wasteland. He will conquer the world. Back to the present, the Orc King is enraged, yelling for Chris to die. No living being has ever survived against me, and that's how I conquered everything. Chris is blocking the barrage of attacks as the Orc tells him that there is no human that he can't crush. Chris tells him to shut up. He wants to protect his people and everything that he risked his life to build. He will never back down, no matter what kind of monster shows up. We shift back to the ambush in the canyon, and Chris's knights are being pushed back. But as long as each and every one of them have something to protect, they will never give up. The Orc and Chris get ready to give a final exchange, both screaming at the top of their lungs. Their powers meet and create a huge vortex, but Chris's slash removes one of the Orc King's arms. And now, the mighty monster is left speechless. I, the supreme being, lost to a mere human? Chris wastes no time and removes the head of the Orc King. Delchan is amazed. Chris actually did it. He beat that monster, despite being a human, the hero of the battlefield, Chris Proudman. With this, the war with the orcs ended, and the death of the orc lord made all the remaining forces retreat. Mankind also suffered many casualties. Thankfully, our boys didn't die in the canyon ambush, as they dealt with the orcs there. But in the end, humanity was protected. Chris ended up using his special healing powder on Pumpkin, and honestly, very worth it. This show can't go on without our good boy. Pixie is amazed by watching this miracle medicine work, but Chris tells Pumpkin from now on he can't join him in battle, and promises to protect him. Two weeks pass and they meet with Chris once again. He asks again if Chris would join the Eight Gates, but Chris tells him that... Sorte would entrust him if he betrayed his own nation. Sorte agrees but thinks to himself that he must absolutely never make an enemy of Chris. He wants to reward Chris with something, but Chris says he already has what he wanted. Sorte smiles and says that he already prepared a gift, and he will see it once he gets back to Sir Cardo. We see Chris with Pixie on his way back looking for Pumpkin, and he appears in a distance, looking at Chris. Pixie thinks that the wolf might want to stay for a while, as he feels he is holding Chris back. Chris has a sad expression, but understands, and tells Pumpkin that he will see him again. The orc elder is surprised that the orc king failed. His skin starts to melt away as the disguise is shown. And it's the same fairy that encountered Chris. And he knows now that his real target is Chris Proudman. Man, why why they get why Pumpkin gotta leave, man? man? It's my favorite character. I don't know. Is Pumpkin gonna train? Is he gonna get stronger, man? I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see what happens. But that makes me really sad. Thank you for joining us on Manhua Assassin today. If you enjoyed our Manhua manga recaps and want to stay updated on all the latest releases, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell.
Your support means the world to us. Grappe is seen slithering around and enters Lin's office and asks how his day is going. Lin is tired of having to do Chris's work and is getting quite busy. But today is the day, the coronation. After the orc wave ended, Proudman was a land that operated with the scale of a national budget and became comparable to the nation capital, Daybreak. Chris also brokered peace between Sir Cardo and the Eight Gates and was looked at as the mediator between the two sides. The country signed a 10-year peace agreement. After the war, we shift to the capital and Chris is walking up to Eric, all dripped out, almost like he's the king. Eric says that Chris is the hero that saved the continent and helped this country secure peace, and as such, he needs to be rewarded. Starting today, his dukedom will be recognized as a country ruled by a prince. And now Chris has been promoted to Prince of Proudman. We shift to a few months later and Grappe is freaking out over some blue spots on his body. Pixie tells him to relax, they just use too many blue herbs. It seems Pixie is experimenting on Grappe despite his concerns. He begs Chris for some help for his suffering, but Chris did promise Pixie a test subject, so suck it up Grappe. Digo comes into the room telling Chris that the info he asked for is here, and the two leave despite Grappe's cries for help. We see Chris and Digo getting ready to leave and Chris gives a message to the rest of his knights, telling them to train hard at the places he secured for them. Alice comes running out asking for a spar with Chris, but Chris just ignores this request and tells her to go to Guien and learn some real swordsmanship. Alice is hesitant to go, but Chris tells her that this is an order from the prince. Now go. Chris heads off and says bye to his boys for now. As they're walking, Digo says that Chris's armor is quite heavy, and that's the reason they're going on foot, because no horse can withstand the weight. Chris tells Digo that they're headed to Valtus, the city with the greatest craftsman for forging iron. There's a blacksmith that Chris needs to meet, and only this craftsman can fix Chris's armor. Chris asks Digo if he can run, and the two start sprinting. And after a while, Chris informs Digo that they have another two days until they get there. But Chris can never go on a peaceful walk as an arrow is fired at him. Chris catches the arrows and spots some young kids that fired it, who are in awe of Chris's strength. They try to run, but Digo comes flying in, and one of the kids bravely tries to face Digo, to give his friends enough time to escape. His skills aren't that good, and he whiffs one slash and gets knocked out. The rest of the kids try to run, but Chris makes a line in the ground with his sword, and tells the kids that if they pass this line, they won't be spared. The kid Digo knocked out is already almost back on his feet, and this actually surprises Digo. Chris can see that this boy is the leader and rounds the kids up. He starts to laugh. Child robbers, huh? Chris is impressed that they try to take him on. The kid's face turns serious. Huge bodies aren't impenetrable to knives. Chris likes his attitude and gives the boy a chance. His head or the head of your friends. Choose who dies. The leader confidently says that he will sacrifice himself all day. And this makes Chris like him even more. Chris asks for the kid's name. And the kid's name is Vans, with no last name. Chris remembers this name and knows that this man will grow up to become a mercenary leader who took advantage of the state of the world after the orc waves. Chris won't take Vans head, but instead offers him a job. Vans has no idea who this is, but is shocked to hear that this is Chris Proudman, the hero of the war. The kid starts listing the achievements of Chris, and this kind of strokes the guy's ego, but one rumor strikes the wrong nerve. Some people are saying Chris is a eunuch and has no dick, since he's so young and is still single, despite his status of prince. Chris knows that only one person would be responsible for spreading this rumor, Lind, as you see him laughing in the distance. Chris tells Van to get up and make a decision. Will you serve under me? Van thanks Chris for the offer, but he won't serve under someone else. This is the stigma of a gladiator slave. Chris finally understands what these kids are and their runaway slaves. Chris assumes that they are from a nearby city, and this is correct. This nearby city is a lawless state that borders Circardo Antigas, which is controlled by nobles and the Thieves' Guild. In this area, the slave trade is permitted, and also a huge part of the economy is the gladiator arena. Chris asks Van how he ended up being a bandit, and he was forced into this life since no one would take him in. And due to him being a runaway slave, Chris understands and asks the boy what he wants to do. I'm sure you have some plans. Are you going to rob people for the rest of your life? and get captured again? Or do you want a better life? Vans doesn't want to continue down this path, and Chris smiles. He hands him an artifact, but it's way too heavy, but at least he can sort of lift it off the ground. Which is impressive, because Vans is similar to Digo, in bone structure and muscle density. Chris says that now, these kids are actually robbers who stole the prince's spear. We shift to the stateless city, and the boys bring a spear to a member of the thieves' guild, who is impressed with his haul. But interrupting the meeting is Chris and Digo kicking the door down, because handles are for losers. The thieves' guild commander calls for his men, but obviously they're quickly dealt with, as one man is sent flying into a wall. 
The man recognizes Chris and asks why he is doing this. Chris smiles and it seems he knows this place. The man quickly apologizes and said that he didn't know that it was Chris's spear. Chris says that if he's really sorry, then shut down the gladiator arena and hand over the kids. Or I could use this as an excuse to blow up your whole city. The man has no choice and follows Chris's orders. We see Chris setting up the kids in a carriage that's headed for Proudman. He gives them a letter saying that if they show this to the guards, they're going to be taken care of. Van sticks around and wants to know why Chris is doing this. Chris tells Van to think about his position. He wants to give opportunity to anyone who has value. Just because you came up as slaves doesn't mean you will die as such. Vance is in awe of Chris and swears to serve him until the day he dies. Before they keep going, Van is tasked with lifting the box of armor. Digo is confused on why they are trying this, but Chris tells him to hold on for a second. After some seconds of struggle, Vance actually manages to lift the box, but only slightly. He falls back down in exhaustion, and Chris is right about his suspicion. He orders Digo to train Vance every day from now on. Vance has the potential to be a wise knight. Two days pass and Chris and Digo arrive at their destination, the city of Valtus. They go to a local inn and get some food, and Digo tells Vance to watch his manners. Chris asks a bartender if there's a guy called Half Man, but is told that he's probably out on the sea. This man has been going around telling people that he is going to be a sailor. Chris has met this man in his past life and knows that he has no interest in the ocean, and hopefully his personality didn't change. We shift back to the stateless city as a man is talking to a commander from Tegas, explaining the situation. It seems Chris did them pretty dirty, and the two wonder if they should follow him. But by now, the bad guys are starting to understand that fighting Chris means certain death. But suddenly, an attendant appears with a letter from the Lord, and it seems that he's not happy with what happened here, and is ordered to report back to Glacier Hill. Now, Chris has pissed off some powerful people. We shift to some new characters talking about the northern continent finally making a move and their new target is Proudman. A few days pass and Chris and Digo are strolling around the docks and they notice that someone has been following them since last night. Digo offers to eliminate this pest, but Chris tells him to leave it for now. It's best to let their enemies think that they are unaware of their actions. Chris approaches some workers and asks if the ship with the dwarf on it has returned yet, and Chris is quickly pointed in the right direction. He overhears the dwarf that he's looking for being scolded by the ship captain. He tries to apologize, but it seems the captain is at his wit's end. The dwarf not only tore the sails and almost killed everyone, he also drank all the booze. Get lost. The dwarf tries to beg but is given the boot and quickly after he gives up and curses his own luck. Chris approaches calling the dwarf by his name, Rhindorf, which takes him off guard. Chris cuts to the chase and asks if the little guy is a blacksmith and there's some work that he needs him to do. Rhine looks away and tells Chris to go look for someone else. Chris is a little shocked. The Rhindorf he remembered wasn't like this. Shy? The Rhindorf he remembered wasn't this shy. Chris asks the young dwarf to show him around the city. It is his first time after all. Rhindorf is confused but doesn't really have anything else to do. And just to sweeten the deal, Chris offers some more booze to the young dwarf, which makes him quickly accept this offer. Quickly accept this offer. We shift to the two sitting in the local tavern as we hear Rhindorf share his side of the story on why he was kicked off of the ship. Chris asks the dwarf, didn't you want to become a sailor to run away to the sea? These words change the air around Rhindorf as the dwarf becomes serious, asking how Chris knows him. Chris thinks back to his previous life and of course he knows him. Rhindorf once saved Chris's life, but it didn't happen this time. Chris makes a lie saying that he once helped the dwarf and instead of receiving payment, the dwarf just said to pass the favor down to the next one that he meets and buy them a drink. Something so strong your nose will turn upside down. Rhindorf is taken aback by the gift that Chris has prepared. It's Tegas's finest liquor, Griffin's Breath. Rhindorf is happy and wonders if he is even worthy to drink something like this. Chris tells him to have at it, and once Rhindorf has a couple sips, he gets to the point, asking Chris for his name, and is surprised to find out that he is talking to the hero of the war, Chris Proudman, and is even more shocked to find out that he is here only for him. Chris tells Rhindorf his plan bluntly. He wants to fight the residents of the glacier. The young dwarf is taken aback by these words and asks if the box behind Chris is dragon's flesh. And after Chris confirms this, Rhindorf invites him back to his place. We shift to Chris following the dwarf into the mayor of Baltus's residence. He shifts some supplies to reveal a secret passage. The group begins going down the long stairway and Chris is shocked to see an underground forge. The reason this forge was hidden was to avoid the fairies. This race was always jealous of the dwarf's skill. And as soon as the dwarves stopped being useful to them, their race was nearly wiped out. And a few surviving dwarves went into hiding underground. Rhindorf started drinking to soothe his mind over the tragic loss of his brothers and sisters. The desire of his people to return to the surface looks impossible to fulfill. Chris turns around looking serious, and it seems the folklore was true after all. We shift back to Chris's past life and he talks to Lind. 
Lin says that the state of the continent is a result of an elite group. The orc wave, the annihilation of the orcs, and all other wars were all fabricated and have a deeper motive behind them. This group was trying to reshape the world, and everyone is playing into their hands. Chris doesn't believe those words, but Lin doesn't feel the need to make Chris believe him. He goes to tell Chris a secret, but we don't see what he says. We shift back to the present as Lind is staring face to face with an elf, asking why she has come. The elf is surprised that Lind isn't flustered. Lind Sonat, you're calmer than I expected. You have the last name of the Northern Empire, the descendant of the clan exiled from the Northern Empire for not having green eyes. But I have an offer for you, Lind. Lind is not interested and tells this bitch to kick rocks, and the elf tries to convince him. If this conversation goes well, it might be possible for Lind to return if he accepts. Lin asks what the penalty will be if he declines, and the elf starts listing all the names of all of his friends in the Proudman estate. You can't protect them alone, Lin. Lin turns around in anger as the elf asks him to give up information about his comrades. We shift back to Chris telling Reindorf to come with him to Proudman. The elves won't be able to harm you there. You don't have to hide anymore. And in exchange, Chris will help him achieve the dream that the dwarves could not. Reindorf asks for a few days to think about it, and Chris agrees. In the meantime, Chris leaves his armor here, and Reindorf is amazed, and gives Chris an estimate of about two weeks that he will need to fix it. But it's doable. Chris is shocked by the talent of this dwarf and leaves it to him. Before he leaves, he hands Reindorf his spear as well and asks to borrow a sword. We shift to the next day and Chris is personally training Vans in the power of Wise. He lets him continue to train and goes out of the town. Digo doesn't see the person following them and Chris is now worried. What was their purpose? Are they not after me? Digo is a little overwhelmed by the sprawling city but Chris tells him that this is the famous market hub. Baltus sells goods all over the continent. Chris starts to think about another person that should be in Baltus around this time. And obviously he has to spend zero time looking for this person because he spots him right away and this is like the fifth time it happened in the story. But I mean, I wouldn't want him to look over and waste time too so I guess it's okay. He leans over to a seller's mat and asks what this item is used for. This malnourished man tells Chris that this is an amulet that protects the body from magic, and it works only for one day. Chris wonders how to activate it, but apparently it activates once it touches the skin. The seller immediately gets surprised because Chris knew the spell needed to be activated, and asks who the hell Chris is. Chris just laughs and says that he knows a little bit about magic, and the boy calms down. It's the same as before. This was Chris's cooking teacher, and as always, he is way too trusting. We are introduced to Vitalia. Digo interrupts Chris telling him that the spy is back on their tail, with backup. Chris starts off with Digo telling Vitalia that he will pay later, and the two sprint into an open field. The spies start to panic and wonder how they've been found out. Chris gives them no time to think and dashes in at the elves, asking what these people are doing all the way down here. Chris begins fighting one of the elves and immediately overpowers him. The elf tries to use a spell, Restraint, but Chris uses the amulet that he just got to nullify this effect. Digo slices one of the elves in two and the leader tries to run away. Chris is in pursuit, but as he chases, he is stopped by the third spy. Digo continues to chase as well, but the elf uses a spell to block Digo's path and manages to slip away. Chris analyzes the situation. Was he calling backup? The elves are already on the move, and if it wasn't for Vitalia's amulet, Chris would have been helpless. He tells Digo that they need to move up the schedule. The situation has changed. We shift to Lin chained up in a basement, and he already gave the elves the information they wanted. But why is he still being held hostage? The elf says that she needs to confirm this info first, before letting him off the hook. Lin tells the elf to promise not to harm the citizens of Proudman, and this elf is introduced as Gudrun. She orders the assassins to go to Proudman and take care of the key targets. Doki is in the south and is too far for now, and Alice is in Guyenne, and that would be too much trouble to deal with at this moment. There's only one target they can go after right now, Louis Yolnovin. We shift to Louis struggling to find the place that Chris tried to send him. Louis continues to look, but is pretty lost. We shift back to Chris telling the knight that his sword is actually part of a pair. Someone intentionally split this sword into two halves and hid them away. That's why it has a weird shape. And once the two halves are reunited, the weapon will gain a mysterious power. Louis is now interested, asking Chris where the other half is. And Chris tells him that it should be along the northern border of the central continent. But Louis has been searching for days, and apparently, when he's close, the other half will just call to him. But nothing's happened yet. Louis notices that there are some uninvited guests stalking him, and all of a sudden, Louis's blade starts to vibrate, leading him in a certain direction. The man ends up in a mountain with a weird dungeon entrance, and there's some weird writing on the wall as well. The sword is urging him to enter. 
before Lewis can step inside, a huge rock golem emerges. Lewis apologizes for waking this thing up, but it doesn't really care about his words, and slams its fist into the ground. Lewis evades, but the elves start their attack from behind. Lewis curses them for being so cowardly. The elves tell Lewis that his sister is dead, and this enrages the man, as he kills an elf in a single slash. The elf is shocked. They were told that if they said these words and showed a sample of Agatha's hair, Lewis would become enraged. But the hair that was shown is the wrong color. Now, don't you ever say my sister's name again, trash. Don't think you will return alive. Before Lewis can deal with the last elf, the golem slams the ground hard, shattering the earth, causing the mountain to start a landslide. There's no time to evade, and the only option that Lewis has is to venture inside of the dungeon. Lewis dives inside, but sees the entrance covered with rubble. We shift back to Valtus as Vitalia is waiting patiently for his payment, wondering if he's being scammed again, but is surprised to see Chris walking back up to him. As an apology, Chris wants to treat this merchant to some food and pay for the amulet. Chris sits with his cooking teacher and gives him a special dish, asking if this suits his taste. Natalia is quite happy with this assortment of food, and it has a sharp spice that melds well with the meat. This is the most delicious thing that he's ever eaten. And ironically, this was the dish that was taught to Chris by Vitalia in his last life. Chris asks for the man's name, and is surprised to see Vitalia give a fake name, Nauri. Chris brings up the western continent, a place full of mages. I once heard that wizards from this place hardly ever communicate with people outside of their world, due to their closed door policy. But sometimes, runaways occur. And these wizards who run must be brought back, sometimes by bounty hunters. Chris has heard that one of these mages is hiding here in Valtus. Vitalia immediately folds under the pressure, asking if Chris is after him. But Chris just laughs, saying that Vitalia just gave himself up just now way too easily. Chris tells him to calm down. He is on his side. And actually, Chris battled an elf today and used this amulet. Chris introduces himself and asks Vitalia to join him. Vitalia knows about Chris's identity, but swore to stay away from magic. Chris knows that because this man ran away to pursue his dreams of becoming a chef. Chris says that it's a shame. Natalia would experience some delicious food in Proudman. Thousands of spices are imported from each country, a place with endless gourmet feasts. Chris pretends to walk away, apologizing to Vitalia, but now he's too invested not to come. He grabs at Chris's leg, promising to serve him with all of his heart. We see Doki traveling with his brother as they are about to cross into another tribe's territory. His brother says that it's okay to enter now. Crape has been up to some diplomacy in the region, and has secured relationships with the tribe. All of a sudden, five armed men appear in front of Doki. The man introduces himself as Haiga the Tongueless Tiger, and he isn't here to fight, but to escort Doki to his king. After a short walk, Doki enters the tent to meet Bratang, the Roaring Elephant, king of the current federation. The king asks Doki what brought him to the south, and Doki answers. He is here to enter the Hawk's Den. Bratang grabs his axe and tells Doki that right now the tribes are not united, and the Northern Empire promised them peace, and if they refuse, they will be attacked. The elves want your head, Hawk. Bratang tells Doki to calm down though. He's gonna honor his agreement with Grappe, but he can't refuse the request from the elves, so he has a suggestion. Stay here for two months. Doki understands and agrees, and the two bump axes, which is the most viking shit I have ever seen. They shift to the elves meeting, and they assume that Doki is dead, but for some reason the elephant tribe won't hand over the body. The lead elf knows that she can't trust the southerners, and also she can't come in contact with the assassins that she sent after Lewis. They should have been reported back already. Shortly, a knight approaches the captain, telling them that the assassins that went to Proudman have returned, and it seems they were met by Rachel and the Hundred Daggers, and quickly dealt with. Only one was allowed to return. The elf returns to Lin, asking when he planned this, and Lin begins to laugh, asking if this elf really thought that something like this could ruin everything that Chris built. Lin never planned to give up anyone, but I guess the jig is up. Right, Taikil? Taikil, who are you talking about? And right out of the ceiling comes our favorite teacher, dashing through bashing through the walls. The elf leader is now in disarray. How did you find this place? We shift back to Lin telling Grappe about his travel. He notices the strange way that Lin is talking. He is doing this due to the elves honed hearing. Before Lin left, he winked and says he entrusts his work to Taikil. And this was the secret message, for Taikil to trail Lin. Back to the present, Lin is released as more elves barge into the room. Lin unsheathes his artifact, ready to show these northerners their punishment. Both sides flare up their wise and a brawl ensues. Lin connects with the leader as Taikil takes the two underlings, but as the captain is getting focused on Lind, Taikil hits her with a chop to the back of the neck, preventing her from using wise. Taikil interrupted her flow, and now the situation is looking dire for the northerners, as they are sent hurling out of the building. They call for a retreat and watch on. Lind grits his teeth, 
the war has started, and there's nothing more for them to do. The Captain Elf returns to Aang Zing, apologizing for her mistakes. Aang Zing tells her not to worry, as he thinks that Chris is more powerful than he once thought, and he can and he can even neutralize magic. Another report tells the leader that Chris is on the move, headed towards Wixus. These words intrigue Aang Zing. That's right, Wixus. He hired a mage and used talisman to counteract magic. If Chris manages to connect with the mages, this will be trouble. Aang Zing summons Gaedron and tells her to take the Shadow Crass, the Northern Empire's magical assassination unit, and to hunt down Chris right away, before he can reach Wixus. We see Chris traveling with his new companion and we shift back to their original conversation. As Vitalia tells Chris that he is being hunted for leaving Wixus, and if he is caught, he will never be able to use magic again. Vitalia asks asks Chris to please sneak him in to meet with his master for permission. But the issue is, is that Vitalia is returning as a fugitive, and it might not be all sunshines and rainbows. But it's okay, like always, our boy Chris has a plan. And of course, we don't know what this plan is. Back to the present, Chris is running, but thinking about his strategy. It's gonna be close. We shoot to Gaedron, taking the assassination unit to find Chris. They need to end him now. If he gets the Wixus, it'll be too late. We shift to Ellis and Guillen having a friendly spar, and of course, Guillen is showing her who's boss. Ellis begs for another round, but Elowan arrives with a letter for Guillen. He reads it and immediately tells Ellis to return to Proudman. Guillen has his own mission. He tells Elowan to gather the knights of Ludwig. We shift back to Aang Zing, who has Guillen and his knights approaching their border, and they're setting up lodging. We see some Northern Empire scouts approach the group asking why they are here. Guillen walks up to them asking what the problem is. This is still Sir Cardo territory. The scouts try to talk shit, but Guillen fires up his aura, scaring the shit out of them, and tells them that the next time they appear in front of him like this, they're gonna die. Thinks on this on this peculiar situation and assigns some guards to keep watch. Back to Gaedron and the assassins, they're in hot pursuit as one of the knights activates a special wise ability, which allows him to see Chris's position. Chris feels the presence, and now he is surrounded by the group of assassins. They plunge onto Chris, but Digo offers to hold them back. Chris tells his party to keep running. The assassins start sprinting at full speed, but right before they can catch up, they smack a barrier. A cloaked man approaches, asking if these elves forgot about the unbreakable vow between Vixus and Glacier Hill. The elves can't think of a good excuse and continue their chase, which makes the mage erupt in anger. A barrage of spells are hurled back and forth with combination of elements, as two more mages stand by, ready to fight. The elf tells these people that an intruder just entered Wixus, and they need to capture them now. If they handle this together, the elves will leave. The head mage calls for Nauri, and she confirms the intruders. The man asks if they can be brought alive. But it's not looking good right now because Chris is holding Vitalia hostage. The man understands and tells the elves that what they want is impossible. The elves start to get defensive, but the mages give no explanation and continue casting spells, repelling the assassination squad. If you cross this line again, it'll be war, Gaedron. Gaedron orders the troops to retreat. Vitalia yells at Chris, calling him a fraud, but Chris whispers for him to be quiet. This is all a part of the plan. Chris starts to negotiate with the mages, asking for payment for this captured mage. He doesn't trust that he will be paid. The mages agree and release, a, and release the fog surrounding Chris, telling him to follow close. The group walks and Vitalia greets Nauri. The man tells him to shut it, you're not the friend I once knew. Until the council passes judgment, you are nothing more than a fugitive. The group arrives at Wix's square and a barrage of lights appear. Chris gets defensive, but the group of mages tells him to stand down. Ectalia, the master of Wixus, appears. He sees the weird group of bounty hunters compromised of two wise knights and a boy, and Vitalia looks too well fed to be a hostage. It seems he was treated well. Chris is surprised that his plan has already been seen through, and stops this little charade. Chris introduces himself as Chris Proudman and gets to the point. The King of the North is trying to take over the continent. Ectalia is shocked and asks Chris for proof. Nari informs the master of what just happened at the border, and they've been in pursuit for some time. Chris tells Ectalia that if his country falls, Wixus will be next. Chris asks the mage, Vitalia, to accompany him to the north and deal with the situation. Ectalia asks if this is true, and his old friend Nari thinks something is off. There's no way Vitalia has been noble. There's no way Vitalia has a noble cause like this. He's always been skeptic about wizard wizards. We shift to the memory between the two as we see Vitalia stealing some bread, looking to skip class. Nauri tries to question what's going on, but the master sees Vitalia with the bread. He shoves a loaf into Nauri's mouth and continues to run, now making Nauri an accomplice. We see the two make it to a cliffside as Nauri tries to urge Vitalia to take his studies more seriously. Vitalia, however, doesn't want to be kept in Wixus. He wants to see the world. 
Nari tells the boy that their destiny is here in their hometown, his wizards. But Vitalia is not interested in having his story written for him. Back to the present, Vitalia coughs up the real reason he is here with Chris. But there's another reason why he decided to join Chris in the end. A talisman that he created saved someone's life. And once something like that happened, a fire lit inside of the young mage. And not even he can explain it. Now he wants to accept his destiny as a wizard and use the power that he's been given to protect the world. Chris is shocked by hearing these words and Ectalia grants Vitalia permission to leave and fulfill his duties. The leader of the mages knows that the north can shake up the continent at any moment, so Vitalia will be, will be in charge of reconnaissance. There are some regulations in the western continent, so Vitalia will only be able to use Meister's magic, which is the magic to create special tools. Chris smiles and agrees, because this is what he wanted from him anyways. Ectalia places his hand on his student and says that the spell is done. Vitalia thanks him once again before leaving, and Nari smirks at his childhood friend, telling him not to embarrass the world of wizards. Ectalia starts a teleportation spell, and Vitalia waves goodbye to Nari and the rest of his comrades. In a flash, the group is transported miles away, and now Vitalia has a surge of determination. We shift to Chris returning to the city to meet the dwarf and his armor is looking brand new. Even his dragon slayer is in perfect condition. Chris asks what Reindorf plans to do and he stutters briefly. Chris continues that he will make sure that in his state there will be a place that the dwarves can gather and hide away from the eyes of the elves. Chris swears it upon his name. Reindorf thinks on it for a moment but decides to put his trust into Chris, shaking his hand in agreement. A carriage arrives to take the group back to Proudman, but Chris still has work to do so he's gonna stay for now. He hands a letter to Digo telling him to take this to Grappe. Vitalia bids farewell to Chris and the group is on their way. Chris watches and his demeanor changes. It's time for him to get going too. The failed assassins return to Angzing in defeat, and his anger is becoming hard to hide. He's given Proudman a reason to wage war, and because of this, the western continent that once wasn't an issue will likely back Chris. Angzing wouldn't be surprised if someone came for his head at this very moment. He's even being watched by the border. He orders his men to gather all of the supplies gathered at this location and return to base, and be on standby. A few days pass and Chris meets up with Fox and he's looking for a certain person, and Fox is leading the way. Chris thinks that Angzing should be aware that Wixis is cooperating with Proudman, and he must be starting to prepare some precautions. Chris needs to find a weapon to help counteract this. He needs this girl's help. Chris approaches a girl chilling on a rock that laughs at the boy's young age. Are you really the hero of the battlefield? This is another one of Chris's previous mentors and partner and one of his partners from a previous life. The treasure hunter, Jennifer Rosar. We shift back to Proudman and Digo is talking with Grappe and it seems Pixie is still experimenting on him but nothing seems to be working. Grappe changes the conversation and asks about the two new arrivals behind Digo. Digo explains that Chris let them join their union and hands him the letter Chris wrote. Grappe takes a glance and knows that he has a lot of work to do now. Tykeel is overseeing the training of the Proudman army while Digo trains his new student. Vitalia and the dwarf are hard at work constructing their creations, and Ellis is guarding the gate. She spots Royce and Digo returning, and one here has passed. Grappe is starting not to be a hunchback, and it seems the brace is actually working. A crow enters the room with a letter from Chris, and it seems that he has returned. All of Chris's knights bow before him, and Chris immediately looks at Lind, wanting to get payback for the prank that he played earlier. But out of the corner of his eye, Pumpkey comes charging in, and oh my god, he's back. Let's fucking go. Chris is overjoyed seeing his longtime friend, and begins walking around with Grappe, asking him for updates regarding the elite soldiers, and the weapons that he was building. Everything is almost complete, and Guy is also finishing up his watch at the northern border. Chris asks if there have been any incidents, but there have only been a couple of small skirmishes, mostly handled by the Hundred Daggers, and Amelia has been weeding out spies trying to enter the territory. Chris is pleased and hands Grappe a bag full of maps. It's all of the terrain surrounding the Northern Empire. Chris wants Grappe to, to put together a military map. Some time passes and Chris meets with Agatha and tells her he needs to leave again. But the Riz Master isn't done yet, and tells her that when he returns this time, he's gonna take her on a little trip. Agatha gets flustered and can't possibly accept this from her lord, but Chris tells her to think about it and to give her answer once he returns. Chris suits up in his Chad armor and begins the military gathering. He stands atop his podium and calls out to his men. Together, we have crafted the most beautiful, peaceful, and magnificent nation, and we will continue to build upon this grace, so our descendants can prosper in this land. However, there is a group that threatens that very prosperity, and they've been attacking for over a year. These elves tried to eliminate our knights and infiltrate our lands. Chris pulls out a document and presents it to the crowd. This is a list of all the crimes the Northern Empire committed while Chris was watching over for a year. Threats, bribery, assassinations, countless clans and countries have been oppressed by these people. The dark clouds are threatening to overtake not only our kingdom, but the entire continent. Rise, my warriors. It's time to put an end to this tyranny. I, Chris Proudman, declare war 
with Glacier Hill and the Northern Empire. At the Northern Empire border, the elves see some dust gathering in the distance and are in awe to see Chris leading his army to their very gates. Lind orders his archer units to take aim and they start firing, unleashing a volley of deadly fire onto the Northern soldiers. Chris orders his men to charge and Angzing gets the news that they are under attack. It seems the war has finally reached its pinnacle. Chris Proudman. Figo, in his new badass armor, starts mowing down soldiers and even breaches the castle wall. Soldiers begin rushing in and Digo uses a strange magic device in his hand to relay information. Gien, Ellis, and Doki all use the same device to signal their breaches in the wall as well. Gudrun tries to defend but her comrade tries to tell her that all is lost, they need to retreat. Gudrun is baffled. Proudman is strategically striking their weak points, almost like they know their movements. What the hell is going on? Chris relays his orders to keep advancing and with Vitalia's stone attached to everyone's gauntlets, this is going to allow some long distance communication. Chris smiles and the battle is in his hands. Gudrun orders his troops to retreat and Chris's men are being held back. He orders for the heavy armor unit to advance into the archer fire. They begin scaling the hill and the northern archers try to defend but, but retreat quickly after. This day ends in a complete victory for Proudman. Most of the enemies are half-breeds and now the remaining force is made up of elf soldiers. The northern continent is called the Glacier Hill. It is a plateau made of four distinct terrains. The front is a forest that acts as a gateway and Chris needs to make it through this forest with little casualties. Chris orders the logging unit forward to secure a safe area. Nighttime comes and elves are trying to set an ambush but Lin stands by with his bow in hand, sniping the elves with his wise powers. Gudrun orders his troops to fall back and two days pass. The enemy has yet to make a move on Chris's men. Royce questions what they should do. Elves have the advantage at night due to their heightened senses and Chris knows this. What are they thinking? Two men are watching but two mutated creatures emerge from the brush, killing the lookouts. A signal alerts Chris to Lin's squad. A large group of goblins is attacking. Goblins? Chris is shocked. It's just too many goblins should be just a group. But then Chris remembers that there was an army of goblins occupying the mountains near Proudman, but they suddenly disappeared. This is where they were the entire time. Chris begins to sweat. Something's off. These aren't normal goblins. They aren't afraid of death and don't feel pain. They're like soulless corpses. They're brainwashed, as we see elves using magic to control them. Chris and his knights are chopping down the creatures left and right, but there is no end in sight. Lin tries to see a way to end this, but looks deep into the trees, to see Gudrun controlling the goblins with her eyes. Lin relays this information and asks for Ellis' unit to support, and they go for the elves. Gudrun is informed of this attack, and Ellis and Lind team up to try and kill her. Ellis asks if he is seeing anybody, and maybe after the war, they can go on a date. Lind is absolutely stunned, telling Ellis that this is not a good time for jokes. Ellis tells Lind that she isn't joking and, and Lind isn't, isn't too shabby and is pretty fit to be her husband. Lind gets flustered but the battle takes back his focus. He tells Ellis that they'll talk about it after this. The enemy tries to retreat and Lind calls for his bow. His wise has a limit and although he's not as strong as everyone else, Lind has developed his very own secret weapon. Steel arrows that the dwarf help him cra helped him craft. Lind is putting all of his power into this shot. Hurricane Arrow. The shot is sent at incredible speed and it strikes Gudrun, taking half of her body with it. Gaedrun watches her sister be taken apart by the arrow and now Ellis catches up. Gaedrun tells the troops to run away as she engages Ellis but her weapon is quickly launched into the air as the difference between the two shows. Before Ellis can make the finishing blow, Gaedrun throws a smoke bomb but from the smoke, Lind appears with Roll's artifact telling the girl he won't miss this time and slices her head clean off. Lin reports back about the death of the enemy commanders. Two more days pass and the goblins were dealt with, but Proudman has suffered considerable damage, and all they have to show for it is two commander elves. The main force hasn't even been sent out yet. Chris tells his men to prepare. The battle isn't over. Ang Zing asks one of his men if the reinforcements are coming. A messenger came today and it seems they will arrive on time. He tells Holling to get ready. There is a mission. Ang Zing tells his oldest daughter Padron to prepare, because now is the time for her to have her sisters. Chris scales the forest and sees a massive field of snow, the White Lands. The elf army stands across with weaponized mantises and Chris finally sees the main force and the battle commences. Tigo is ripping the elves to shreds but both sides are sustaining damage. Doki slashes his axes down into a mantis and the battle is becoming intense. One of the commanders is sure that this will be a victory but out of the corner of his eyes is the general of Tigus ripping apart the Proudman army. Abel smiles and finally it's his time to kill Chris Proudman. Man these guys can't fight fair but I, I guess it's even if you think about it because Chris does have a lot of information he's not supposed to know so I guess it's even we can say. We shift back to the elves negotiation with Tegas as they are promised the central continent. Back to the present and his men are ripping through the front lines. But as Abel tries to kill the commander, Delchen appears. And it seems our boy Chris has some reinforcements of his own as the eight gates are here to back him up. Spear King and the King of Swords stare at each other ready to see who is superior. 
Chris is continuing mowing down troops as the news is relayed to him. Chris orders the Ludwig Knights to engage. He needs to win the war here and now, while Tegas is busy. And for some reason, Angsing and his mage troops are nowhere in sight. But all of a sudden, a spell is cast, as bugs are warping around the Proudman soldiers. Chris tries to help these soldiers, killing the elves surrounding them, but Chris doesn't see any bugs. And now he knows that this must be some sort of hallucination magic. Chris sees the unit of mages and orders for their destruction. But a huge force begins weighing down on our heroes. The mages can stimulate the five senses in humans, causing extreme pain. Even wisers can escape this spell. With this magic, I am a god. Now bow before me. We shift to Lind and his unit, and Chris left the responsibility of killing to him. But even after searching relentlessly, Lind still can't find him. But all of a sudden, Lind's horse is chopped in half as Padron looks at him. It's you, Lind Sonat, the murderer of my sisters. Don't think you'll return alive. We see Chris still struggling to stand as the soldiers try and kill him in this state, but Digo comes flying in seemingly unaffected by the spell. But each step he takes is giving him unfathomable pain. He continues forward anyways as more mage troops try to engage, but Digo splits them apart with one strike. Digo continues to step forward despite the hallucination wave. We shift back to Digo asking Chris for some advice. He doesn't know how to train his new apprentice, telling Digo that he is the knight with the strength of a hundred people. What are you so worried about? Digo sighs and tells Chris to stop playing around. Other knights develop characteristics that relate to their personalities, but all Digo knows is his strength, and I feel like I'm remaining stagnant. Chris tells Digo not to feel that way. Strength is your talent. Use it to your advantage. Back to the present, Digo's face looks devilish and walks to this elf unit, making Howling tremble in fear. Chris lets Digo know that he is his sworn knight, and no matter what, always push forward. The spell is increased to its maximum levels, but Digo continues to endure. Howling calls for Digo to stop, but Digo grits his teeth to the point blood surges from his mouth. He raises his halberd into the air, gathering lightning at its tip, slamming it down, slicing Howling in half, and decimating the mage force behind him. Chris washes on, simply amazed at the knight with the strength of a hundred people. Digo yells in triumph after slaughtering the mage unit. We shift back to Lin as he squares off against Padron. Lin's demeanor changes, because he knows this won't be an easy fight. One of his archers tries to fire at Padron, but a quick movement from the elf kills all of Lin's surrounding soldiers, in front of his very eyes. Lin tells his men to retreat as he stands alone to duel this elf juggernaut. Padron rushes in and the blades meet. The elf tells Lin that his death won't be graceful, and he will die in the most painful way. Padron sends an upward swing that separates the two, but rushes back in, letting a flurry of attacks that Lind barely blocks. Each blow is heavy, and Lind can't take much more of this. A slice connects with Lind that hits Vitalia Stone, and now he can't call for backup. Lind calms down and tries to come up with a plan. He can't win with sheer strength. Should I try and run away? No, that's impossible. Padron is too fast. Lind knows that there's nothing that he can do, as Padron rushes back in and asks if this human has given up already. Lind takes the strike to his body, but starts to smile. If I have to struggle, and even if I die today, all I need is one hit, one small scar for my comrades who will come. Lind charges up his artifact, but Padron sees through this attack and slices Lind vertically, calling him pathetic. You were the one who killed my sister? You're so weak. Lin lays on the floor lifeless as Padron lifts her sword to finish the job. But in the blink of an eye, Elish dashes in at the very last second, stopping the blow. She sits next to Lin, telling him to hang in there. Padron tells Ellis that her only chance to live is to leave that night, but Ellis stands up with her veins bulging, saying that this is her husband. We shift to Tegas and Delchen, but it seems Delchen put up a decent fight, but he's overmatched. Tegas gives him a compliment and says he'll spare his life, since this was such a good fight. Delchen doesn't need this pity and Abel laughs. Well, I tried to save you. I'll at least remember your name, Sword King. Before Abel can finish off Delchen, Gien appears with his red aura. Abel sees this arrival and knows that Gien is also on the sixth level. Abel laughs. The Duke made a mistake sending his strongest knight here, and calls for his griffin unit to attack. Soldiers flying strange beasts begin to attack the Proudman army. Nova looks up and sees these mutated griffin and pegasus. The knights of the sky are tasked with bringing Chris's head. Guillen tries to react, but Abel comes rushing in. Guillen barely blocks the strike, and Abel tells him not to get distracted. Your focus is on me. Back to Ellis and her fight with Padron, they're exchanging blows, and both of them are feeling the effects of the battle. Ellis tries to stab at the elf, but it misses. Lind begins to stand up again despite his grave injuries. He looks over at Ellis as the rescue squad moves to pick him up. Padron sees this happening and doesn't want to let Lind escape, but Ellis blocks Padron's path. The two continue their duel, but Ellis is continuing to get faster with each swing. He flashes back to Ellis and her father, and Ellis feels like she's hitting a brick wall. She's sparring again, but isn't making any progress. Takil asks his daughter why she wants to be strong. Ellis responds saying that she just wants to defeat the enemy, that's why. But this makes Taikil laugh. 
If that's it, then you still have a lot of room to become stronger. And back to the present, Ellis finally understands what her father meant. And now, she's not swinging her sword just to kill the enemy, but for Lind. She continues her barrage and gets into her stance. Eight wings appear from her back and she uses her ability, the Sword of Speed. She dashes past Padron, ripping her apart, taking one arm clean off. Ellis knows now that she is fighting to protect the people precious to her as her sword glares from her eyes. Chris rushes to Digo, asking if he's okay, as Royce holds him up. But to Chris's surprise, the Sky Knights start their assault on Chris, killing his men. Chris is shocked by seeing Tegas' troops, and Chris watches his men die horrible deaths by fire. He grits his teeth and, and tells Vans to collect all of the spears from the ground. The Sky Knights are starting to get cocky, but a blue aura fills the sky, as Chris starts sniping them one by one. Chris is throwing spears using his wise energy. Energy. The Sky Knights spot Chris and attack as one, but Pumpkey wasn't slacking off either as a huge fire breath separates the two groups. Chris stands in a stance gathering his wise energy, and the Sky Knight captain is in awe of Chris's aura. We flash back again to Chris with his treasure hunter mentor, looking down the ominous cave. Chris overhears his mentor telling him of the horrible creatures that live down here. But to Chris, this is the perfect place to train. He tells Jennifer that if he doesn't return in three months, consider me dead, and leaps into the pit despite his mentor's warning. Chris lands at the bottom as the horde of creatures start to surround him. In complete darkness, Chris welcomes the challenge. He was starving as well, and he wasn't playing around in this last year. Chris, Chris's energy overflows onto the spear, and he surpassed his limits yet again, a level that only appears in stories, level 7 wise. Sight. Chris lets off his move, Thunder Spear, clearing the Sky Knights and the clouds around them. Some Sky Knights survive as Chris begins to mock them and continues his assault. The enemy troops start to lose morale and Digo and Royce join in on the fight. The Sky Knights are starting to get pushed back. Bar Vans uses his wise to slice fire that is approaching Chris. Chris compliments the young knight as he charges another spear. One of the Sky Knights charges up his aura, ready to kill Chris, and charges at him. But Pumpkey blocks his path. Chris yells for Pumpkey to get out of the way, but the wolf's mark lights up, and its body turns bright yellow. And with one claw attack, Pumpkey eviscerates the wise knight. Chris is amazed. Pumpkey's whole body turned golden, and this must be his awakening. And I'm fucking hyped. Pumpkey just went super saiyan. Let's fucking go. The knight tries to fly away with one arm missing, but Pumpkey he blocks his path with his fire breath. Chris stands there mocking the knight, who dared to join the wrong side. Chris tells this man to atone for his sins, even in hell. He unleashes his thunder spear and disintegrates the Sky Knight. Olgadin has fallen, and the Sky Knight's morale is shattered, and they begin their retreat. Chris's wise levels to 78, but the battle isn't over. Him and his knights continue to slash down the enemy, but everyone is getting tired. We see Digo about to collapse and Chris knows that they need to finish this now. A wizard unit appears in front of Chris out of nowhere, and Chris knows that Angzing might be with him. An owl spots Chris and says the target has been found, and the trap is sprung. And Chris is teleported to a different location, surrounded by mages. Angzing tells Chris that finally they meet. And alright guys, that is the end up to chapter 135, and at the time of this recording, that is the last chapter that I have available to read. Uh, they took a little bit of a break in February, so I think they're starting up again. Um, they're going to release a chapter probably the week after I release this. But um, I don't think this whole war arc is going to end for probably another like 10 or 15 chapters. So unfortunately, we're going to have to wait for them to, to pump it out. But as soon as it's all wrapped up, I'm definitely going to make a recap on it. Uh, I thought I'd leave a little bit of my own personal thoughts on the story so far. Uh, I'm definitely loving it. Um, I do think... Uh, the writing is getting a little sloppy in the whole grand scheme of things. It is moving very fast. I feel like towards the beginning, Chris's growth was very slow and steady and you kind of were there at every stage and now a lot of weird shit's happening. I mean, it's cool, don't get me wrong, but the story definitely isn't perfect. But regardless of that, I still love it. Chris is an awesome main character. All the protagonists in the story are all awesome the villains are awesome but um i'm just excited to see what we got in store i mean abel is fighting again which is probably one of the coolest fights we're gonna get to watch it might be up there with uh rolled and chris's fight we'll see chris i don't know how he's gonna get out of this trap i mean we're gonna have to find that out um and yeah i hope lynn's not dead i can't forget about him like if anyone was gonna die i was like praying it's not lynn i need to see him with ellis man like there's no love in this story, man. Chris is just about to get with Agatha and Lynn's about to get a wife, man. That's some fan service right there. But um, yeah, I hope you guys are liking the story. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And uh, in the coming weeks when the next chapters come out, uh, I'll continue the story. Thank you so much for keeping up with me. I'm going to release a, a multiple hour video of this entire story. And if you got all the way to the end, thank you. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.